One, two, three, four. I curse the world one second. Demanded by me a sandwich in the next. Or else I'm bumming the cigarettes That will help me to forget how hungry I am I can't believe that bastard won this morning It's the kind of night for vodka and forties We're mixing our drinks, sip tonight We're mixing our drinks, sip tonight Tomorrow, we're shipped off to Iraq Or else we're cutting off a toe Praying that we won't have to go I can't believe that bastard won this morning It's the kind of night for vodka and forties Who's ready for the war tonight? Who's ready? Stimulants are on the way Cause who doesn't have a drug problem these days? I can't believe that bastard won this morning It's the kind of night for vodka and forties And I'm sniffing those pills hard tonight And I'm sniffing those pills hard tonight I can't believe that bastard won this morning. It's the kind of night for vodka and forties, and we're mixing our drinks, sip tonight. 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 But we all knew that was never good enough They said we had every chance But how could we not fuck it all up We would spend a lifetime Trying to figure out How to make our hearts stop beating We would spend a lifetime Trying to figure out How to make ourselves stop breathing That I was the only kid sitting alone I remember high school And started to notice That not much had changed since I was six years old I would spend a lifetime Trying to figure out How to make my heart stop beating Myself, stop breathing. Stop breathing. This 
this one's for every drug problem that got stopped in its tracks by trip to rehab. I'll miss railing pills with you in the park. This one's for every friend that decided not to drop out and stayed at their mom's house. I'll miss you on the street corner when it starts to get dark because tonight I'm crying about the crack house that got torn down in the center of town and tonight I'm laughing about the army recruiting station lying vacant here's to the rubble a brick through every window a casket buried six feet deep for everybody's heroes here's to our lives being meaningless and how beautiful it is because freedom doesn't have a purpose this one's for every arsonist that got locked down before they burnt the cities down a misty in the skyscrapers on fire! This one's for every friend that got taken off the street So the upper class could sleep, so the upper class could sleep I'll miss the spray paint and slash tires Because tonight I can't smell the pigs around the corner On the shortness of your breath and tonight I can't taste the whiskey from across the room in the stumbling of your steps. Here's to the rubble and a brick through every window, a casket buried six feet deep for everybody's heroes. Here's to our lives being meaningless and how beautiful it is because freedom doesn't have a purpose. Tonight I bury old William without remorse Because hell sleeps around and heaven wants a divorce Tonight I burn my bookshelf to be free Because even a rebel tradition is slavery Tonight I bake my madness a birthday cake Because even the insomniacs aren't awake Tonight I burn my home while they dove in place So tomorrow I can live like I died yesterday Live like I died yesterday Today I stampede killed Superman And Apollo and Dionysus both got hanged Today the revolution laughed and spit in my face But all expenses paid, Donna will take its place Today the dropouts were smarter than the PhDs As they took off with everyone's car without the keys Today I pled failure all the way up to the sky And I grin hopelessly as I sit down to die As I sit down to die
had to guess, Karina, addiction. Pat Pat had serious addiction problems. Um, heroin, specifically, was his drug of choice. Um, and he did a lot of heroin while touring and doing punk and anarchist shows. So I would imagine that he probably has some very sort of mixed emotions about the entirety of the matter. That when he thinks about anarchism, he, you know, thinks of the old days. And the old days aren't exactly good for him. So it's just my take. I don't know. I haven't spoken to the man about it. Um, thank you for the gift sub, Karina. Uh, I'm still in the refractory period, as you can tell. I'm fu I look stoned, I know that, um, but I'm not, I promise. I'm just fucking, I, without like my pre-workout pre drinks or anything, I did my core, my legs, and then my fucking um, uh, weights. Not full weights, but weights. Um, and so, yeah, I'm a little, a little burned. But I wanted to start the stream with, let's see, yeah. <laughs> uh, I wanted to start the stream with a little ga a guessing game. I'm going to read you a statement. I'm going to read you a, um, oh, I want to do this too first. There we go. Um, I want to read you a statement, and you guys can guess what happened. Earlier today, Midland Police Department arrested five members of Midland Christian Schools Administration. While we value and desire transparency, we must protect the privacy of our students and maintain the best educational environment possible under these difficult circumstances. Under advice from legal counsel, this will be our only statement on the matter at, uh, uh, at this time. The five administrators were notified of an alleged hazing incident involving some of our student athletes that resulted in dis school disciplinary action. Subsequently, school leadership was contacted by MPD regarding the alleged incident. Our school officials have and will continue to cooperate with law enforcement and their investigation. Currently, we have qualified acting administrators to supervise the campus oversee student activities, support faculty, and maintain the day-to-day -day operations of the school. The physical, spiritual, and emotional safety of our students is the most important responsibility we bear as educators and one we take seriously. We appreciate the support and prayers of our Midland Christian parents, faculty, staff, and students as we continue leading, building, and equipping for Christ. So does anyone want to take a stab in the dark? I know Caboose went with they touched kids, didn't they? They didn't. They, they, they didn't touch. They didn't touch the kids. Um, this is one of, those, one of those rare incidents when a fucking group of Christians weren't diddling some kids. Um, booze or sex to the students? Uh, nope, no, it's not the the blackface thing either. Um, it it is it's, it, it's a hazing incident at a Christian school, Marcus. Um. But they very, we were notified of an alleged hazing incident. Anyone want to take a shot? <laughs> it, no one died, but I bet there was a moment where somebody wished they had. I'll, uh, I'll put you out of your misery. The three administrators and two coaches that were arrested failed to report the incident of sexual abuse that had occurred on the baseball team where they held a freshman down, repeatedly beat him in the dark, and then shoved a baseball bat up his ass. The fuck? Yeah. Yes, hazing. You know, when you shove baseball bats up somebody's ass. Which, I'm guessing, probably didn't involve a whole lot of industrial lubricant either. As good straight Christians are wont to do, of course. Yes, Marcus, as just Marcus points out. Um, look, if you... Look, I've seen it. I mean, a baseball bat's not that big. I've had probably something bigger. Um, but you have to be willing... 
and you have to consent and you have to be into it and you have to use like industrial grade lubricant to make it happen to hold a struggling, squirming 14 year old boy down and shove a baseball bat up his ass causes much damage, much damage. Uh, beast, I don't know which side, but either side, not good for, you know, somebody who hasn't been, who isn't into it, been into it, knows what to do, knows how to control the muscle contractions and has plenty of lube, right? Like either side of a baseball bat's going to fuck you up in that case. Dry virgin ass who's being raped with it. It's going to shred you. So... You know, um, yeah, that's, it's just a little guessing game. I thought I'd play with you guys is to like, I'll read the statement. We may do, we may do more of this in the future where I read a press release or a statement by a group of individuals and you guys can guess exactly how bad they fucked up. Ah, uh, it, it, it's, you know, fucking this alleged hazing incident, by the way. The kid um, was interviewed by the Children Advocacy, Advocacy Center and had to go to the hospital, right? Like this isn't alleged hazing. This is, this is the rape counselors at the Children's Advocacy Center and the hospital saying this kid was shredded. They're not putting that much in the, the fucking, in the article, but you, you can fill in the line. Like you can fill in the blanks. You're like, oh yeah. Yeah, this, this kid absolutely got fucking wrecked. Like, there's no way around it. And so, like, yeah, it's it's a hell of a fucking thing. What is going on? Um, I, I, this one, Overlook. Um, prior to that, Pierced. I don't know which one, Karina. Um... Probably pierced. YouTube's doing some weird fucky shit. Uh, the ad blocker's not working correctly for some reason. Fucking uBlock Origins fucking up. I, I don't know what's going on. Either way. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I, I, I thought that was I thought that was great, you know. <clears throat> yes. The the victim was pushed to the ground while still being hit. Sorry, um, as the as it goes, he was locked in the locker room. The lights were turned off. Someone yelled Fresh freshman initiation day. Then someone began to hit him. He was then pushed to the ground while still being hit. Everyone screaming at him. He attempted to uh, he stated he then attempted to hit his attacker back, but was told that he was not allowed to hit back. And that was when they raped him with a baseball bat. He fought back. When he fought back, um, that's when they did what they did. Or completed what they did. Um, so, what happens? Well, following the interview, Midland police went to the school to talk to the fucking superintendent. Where do you think? It's fucking Midland. It's Texas, dig. It's fucking Texas. It's always Texas. It's always Florida or Texas. It's always Florida or Texas. It just, just is. Um, beats you in the face, punches you in the gut, stabs you in the chest, snips off a nipple with a pair of shears, shoves a hot iron up your ass, and blows you your head off with a shotgun. Dude, calm down. It's just a hazing. Um... Oh, yeah, yeah, Cassie, I hope so. Uh, following the interview with the Children's Advocacy Center and the emergency responders, um, the Midland police went to talk to the school superintendent. Uh, in in uh, a, um, a gentleman by the name of Jared Lee. Um, so you know the names of the people. Um, uh, Jared Lee, superintendent. Gregory McClendon. 
Matthew Counts, Barry Russell, who's the baseball coach, by the way, and Dana Ellis. Ellis is the secondary principal. Um, uh, Matthew Counts is assistant principal and uh, coach. And I'm sorry, McClendon is athletic director and football coach. And Russell is the baseball coach. Um, so after learning that this freshman, so probably a 14-year-old boy who, you know, may or may not in his own psychosexual development, uh, been comfortable with the idea of something being inserted into his own ass, had a baseball bat rammed up his fucking rectum without any lube in under the guise of hazing at a Christian school. The, the Midlands police decided to say, um, <clears throat> hi, um, why didn't you mention this to us? Because even in Texas, you have a duty to inform. And why were we not informed? Because a student was raped with a baseball bat under your care. You kind of need to file a police report for that sort of thing. And, well, Ellis had notified Lee about the incident in January. And Lee instructed McClendon and Counts to investigate the incident. Lee told the MPD officer on Valentine's Day that he would not turn over the requested documentation about the incident and then refused to answer any more questions over the phone. Well, credit where credit's due, even the Midlands Police Department in fucking Texas didn't put up with that shit. And by later that day, had a search warrant served on the school. It took them less than a day to convince a judge. Search warrant time. Police then obtained all of the documents concerning the investigation, which the officer stated, which were essentially nothing and had only been created a few days prior. During the investigation, officers determined that the five people arrested all had knowledge of the sexual assault, but did not re uh, report it as required by Texas Family Code. Emails obtained by the MPD in that same search reportedly showed clear refusal by those involved to report the abuse to the authorities. They all conspired to hide the sex brutal sexual assault of one of their freshman baseball players from the police. And then the fucking police found the evidence. <laughs> they kept the fucking emails. They kept the fucking emails. They kept the fucking emails. <sighs> At this time, not only are those five uh, administrators arrested, uh, but one juvenile has been arrested as well. Of course, uh, in... in um, in, uh, in alignment or in accordance with Texas Family Code, his name and his charges have not been released. But rest assured, it's the oh, young, good Christian athlete that took a baseball bat to one of his teammates, well, you know, virgin rectum. So, yeah... The um, school is holding a, um, a, a parent-teacher conference right about now, by the way. Um, they're holding a meeting to discuss the baseball team's future. At this time, school has canceled practiced, uh, practice and backed out of an upcoming uh, tournament. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. Oh... I just, you know, I suppose we should get these just so you can see them. Cause I want to name, I, I've named them. I want to shame them like properly. Here. Here, here are the horrible, horrible cunts. 
here's the here's the people that are just the worst people in the world. Say hi to Superintendent Jared Lee and a variety of sports ball people and the secondary principal, Dana Ellis. So, I mean, to be fair, yeah, like Jared, I don't I don't see it. But Gregory McClendon and Matthew Counts and Barry Russell all look like the jock types who probably did shove a baseball out a bat up somebody's ass in their day. So. Oh, hold on. I'm trying that back on. Yeah. It's a video you... Oh, wait. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. They perp walked him. They perp walked him. Definitely seen today circulating on social media. Five school administrators and coaches <laughs> the school being escorted out of the building by officers. According to police reports, oh. all five are accused of failing to report a case of a student who says he was sexually assaulted by being hazed and purposely not reporting it to police. <laughs> How stupid do you have to be? Just report the goddamn thing. <laughs> Is I, I can't imagine, like, I, I'm just, uh, fucking Cassidy, you're here. Like, imagine if Bobby got this case as a PR marketing guy, right? Forget even, like, Marcus's attorney level, right? Like, just as from a PR standpoint, right? We've had a sexual assault on campus, and we're, we haven't reported it to the police. Are you fucking stupid? Report it to the police. You will get arrested, and they will perp walk your ass. Right? Like the PR from this is worse if you don't do this. Yes, I know it's going to be a difficult conversation to be had about how your baseball team basically held down and raped a fucking freshman, but fuck me. You fucking, you're all in a, like a, legal, a, a criminal conspiracy now. Right? Like get that shit reported. Yeah. <laughs> it's just from a PR standpoint. It's like, how stupid do you have to be? Well, you know what it was. Well, this is just unbecoming. We were fucking... <laughs> we're not. Just dumb. Just dumb. Just dumb across the board. Sexually assaulted while being hazed seems a little mild. I mean, it, the news ain't going to be... Um, the news is not going to come out and say a 14-year-old boy had a baseball at shoved up his ass. Right, like a fourteen-year-old, uh, a fourteen-year-old freshman baseball player at the Midlands Christian School was anally raped with a baseball bat by more senior classmates who held him down and brutalized him to the point of rectal tearing and bleeding. Though they should, and make a much better story that way. That's that's how you get a fucking headline, right? Like, yeah. Dude, Midlands Christian School. You know what they're known for? Yeah, holding down fucking virgin 14-year-olds and raping them in the ass with baseball bats. That'll fucking get you some... Uh, that'll sell some copy. Uh, yeah, exactly, Cassie. Um... Yeah. Isn't Texas all against the sodomy too? Just saying. They sodomized that kid. That that fucking that that older kid and all of the ones who held him down and participa participated, they're sodomites. They sodomized him. They're sodomites. That was that was penetration for uh, for purposes other uh, other than procreation. That's sodomy. Just saying, I thought Texas had a Feather up their ass about that one. Uh, this type of shit is stuff you think only happens in movies? No. No. I grew up in America. I, I mean, I've told the story before about Justin, who uh, he was an effeminate gay dude I went to high school with, and I had a fucking dude named Bubba, who I also went to high school with, kick down, his, uh, kick down Justin's front door with a fucking baseball bat in his hand threatened his life for being a fuck uh, for being a fag while dressed in all a uh, clan uniform and it wasn't a fucking costume it was Bubba's clan outfit 
Right? Like I grew up in fucking uh, I grew up in America. It's, this is this isn't shit that I expect only happen in movies. This is shit that happens every day in this bullshit country. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, dick. It might be blame the bottom types. Yes, but they're sodomized for Jesus. So free to go. It was a fire. Oh god. I mean, this isn't even in the same league of oh god. League. Um, but you see that, uh, the satanic he- temple had their, um, their inaugural convention. Satan con, uh, police, um, police had to be called and people were arrested. Oh, not, not the Satanists, by the way, the, the, they were the hotel staff and everybody said they were perfectly lovely to deal with. The attendees of the convention were, were wonderful. They appreciated their business. No, the Christian protesters outside started a brawl because the Protestants showed up and started fighting with the Catholics. Real story. Real fucking story. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, the hotel staff went on record and said, "Oh, the the Satan, the Satan, the the uh, the Satanic Temple people were absolutely lovely, but the Christians outside, yeah, they we had to call the cops on them." <laughs> uh, I I saw I I put a heart on it, Karina. I saw. Congratulations. Uh yeah, gotta love Christian infighting. It's dude, a fucking. <laughs> I it just. <sighs> we might as well finish it. Um, fucking. So, New Jersey, Mercer County. Um, who's this piece of shit? Daniel Bannister. He was charged with murder and endangering the welfare of a child in the death of his three month old daughter, Haley Bannister. Um, he beat his child to death. Um, nine skull fractures, broken ribs, bleeding in her brain. Um, she died six days after the ambulance took her to the hospital. But, um, he's been sitting in jail ever since. But Mercer County Judge Darlene uh, Perexta, may she rot in hell for all eternity, the pig-protecting piece of shit that she is, ruled that the detectives did not have probable cause of criminality to access the phone and therefore excluded all of the evidence that showed he knew exactly what he was doing and it was intentional. The detectives confiscated the cell phones, um, applied for warrant to examine the calls and texts. Court awarded the warrants, and the information was used to charge the couple. There was, quote, extensive communications about Daniel abusing the girl. There's no... I got nothing past that. The prosecutors are going to appeal to the state appellate court, but yeah, medical examiner agreed, hospital agreed, judge who issued the search warrant agreed, but Judge Darlene Perexta, she disagreed. So she ruled out all the, she excluded all the evidence involved. And, well, he's now freed from jail. So the baby murdering cop is free to go back to work. There you go. Um, and so while we're, we're just figuring this one, um, while we're just doing more, we, I think we all, um, I think we all heard about the, um, the San Francisco rape DNA cases, right? 
Um, if you, if you, because judges are cops too, Caboose. Prosecutors are cops, judges are cops, fucking CPS is cops. Um, so San Francisco Police Department has been using rape kits to test victims' DNA to see if there are suspects in other crimes. Now, you might ask, Kai, they're testing the rape kits. Are they testing the rape kits? No. No, they're not. They're not processing the rape kits to see if they can find the rapists of these people. They're processing the rape kits to see if the victim's DNA has been uh, is, uh, is findable in their DNA database and associated with any other crimes. That's all. They're not actually attempting to solve said rapes and say run all of the DNA involved. No, no, that's not, it's not what they're doing. I don't even know what to do with that. Like, re like legitimately, like I can't even get like mad. This just feels, yeah, like c caboose. The U.S. sure does vict love victimizing rape victims. Like, I, it just just feels like this feels like they probably should have been doing this prior, based on these fucking the the, the like reputations of these these police organizations. So I'm surprised this is like really the first time that's really broken news. This this feels to me like something that it's, I would have expected them to already be doing. I'm fucking oh yeah, fuck it. If you don't need any more reasons to fucking re not report a rape. Here's another one. Uh Sounds about right, Cassidy. Thank Bobby for that little insight. Um Let's continue this train. You know what? I didn't do the sound effect. Here you go. Here's just for you guys. All right. Here's another one. Anybody see the video of the uh, 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 the the black teenager in the New Jersey mall? Because it's it's great. I'll see if I can find the video so we can watch it. Mm, that's not the full one. Here it is. Um. Oh, it's the most recent one, um, Kaiser. So... Okay, cool. All right, let's 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 watch it from the beginning, and then we can we can talk about what happened. I'm just gonna point out a couple of things. Notice that one of these kids is straight white as the driven snow, and one of them is not. White kid smacks the black kid's hand out of his fucking face, pushes him. Black kid fights back. Self-defense. Fight ensues. Cops show up. Pin the black kid to the ground. Handcuff him. And keep him, uh, keep him on the ground handcuffed for over a half an hour. While the white kid is free to wander around and talk shit the entire time. Yeah. That's, that's, that's exactly how that happened. New Jersey. It was in a mall. <laughs> it's 
So, you know, that, I, here's another one. So, Christ Crimson, that sucks. Oh, so let me preface this. Uh, we're gonna shift. We're gonna shift locations to Pensacola, Florida. Uh, the Pensacola Police Department is launching an internal investigation. Um, Pensacola Police SWAT officers executed a search warrant last Thursday morning at a home, and they um, well. <clears throat> His two young children, the gentleman um, has gotten himself into a bit of uh, hot water, shall we say. No, no, right house. Um, but he had two children, ages one and three, um, who were inside the home at the, um, at the time. He, they arrested the guy for shooting at SWAT officers, but he says, I shot because they feared they were intruders because they just fucking broke into my house. But either way... The police officers take the children into custody, and this is how the the um, one year old one uh, yeah this is how the one year old was returned. So, you know, that, that, they, um, they dropped the baby on its face. They, they dropped the baby on its face. You know, you, you can see here. They, they, it, those scrapes, they dropped the baby on its face. The police are claiming that the child was left in a vehicle and that when they opened the door, the child fell face first onto the, uh, onto the ground. Um, but let's just say people have doubts. People have doubts. Um, yeah, no car seat dig. No, no car seat. Yeah, it was it was it was a good it was a good uh, it was a good day for for police action, shall we say? Uh, um, we did that, we did that, we did that. All right, was the baby resisting? I mean, probably. You're right, dude. Gifted, you're right. Baby probably had it coming. It was probably crying and like flailing a little bit or something. It like moved when the cop tried to grab it. Definitely resisting arrest. Yeah, it's it's you know. You got to teach him young. You got to teach him to respect authority young. You're right, Gifted. You're right. Uh, <laughs> uh, about this point, I'm more doubt than man. Marcus, I mean, as, a, as an attorney, that's a little concerning. Uh, charged, charged with assaulting an officer. Puked on him. Uh, <laughs> a lot of does the cop have a new butt baby size blood stain on his boot just asking questions oh god all right so i mean in other like what the fuck um y'all wanna y'all wanna get your fucking uh, landlord uh, like hey, landlord hate rape uh hate rape uh hate rage going Sorry, just still still got the fucking Midlands story in the back of my head. Here you go. Uh, where are we going? That one. Um, if there ever was a punchable face. If there ever was a punchable face. Story time. I'm on the way to Jacksonville, North Carolina right now to buy 100 single-family rental houses. 
how to find out about this deal. I had a real estate agent there, no one investor that's interested in selling over 150 units. 100 of them are single family. The other 50, 60 units are multifamily. I don't want those. Here are the details on those single families. The 100 units were comprised of a mix of three bedrooms and two bedrooms. All of them have one or two bathrooms. All of them were built in the 60s or 70s, and all of them are going for $100,000. So the whole portfolio will be trading for $10 million. I'll have to put 15% down with the local commercial bank that I'm using. So 15% of 10 million is $1.5 million. I'll be getting a 3.75% interest rate. The loan will be amortized over 25 years and it will be on a 10 year balloon. About 30% of the units are vacant. So I'm going to reoccupy them with section eight tenants. Jacksonville right now is 11 to $1,200 for section eight on three bedrooms and the other 60, uh, 70 units over time. I'm going to be kicking out tenants and replacing them with section eight. I'll follow along with the journey. You know why he's doing section eight? Anybody know what's what what's happening there? Why that's happening? It's a fun little thing that these real estate assholes do. It uh, it assures his loan from the bank. Basically, um, yeah, it's guaranteed income. It assures his loan from the bank. The bank will look at the Section Eight guaranteed income from the government and give him the loan when he can't afford it. He is leveraging assets that he doesn't even technically own at this point by making these promises. So he's overextending extending himself and forcing the renters to pay his mortgage in the process while he extracts the excess value from the property. He's literally a leech. Yeah, he's literally a parasite. Like, he's he's just a parasite. Um, yeah... Yeah, I'll be kicking those families out. Lovely. So you're going to make some people homeless too while you're at it. Oh, fucking asshole. Yep, standard slumlord move. Straight up, straight up standard slumlord move. Oh. <laughs> quiet day today. A quiet day today. 32 fucking people. Um... Yes, but all the people who need the Section 8 are the real mooches, right? Yes, 100% irresolution, 100%. The, 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 they are the true mooches. Yes, they, they're the ones leeching off the system. Uh, I would argue, Karina, landlords should not be allowed to have a mortgage. That should be the bare minimum of renting a property. You should own the property. If you don't own the property, you shouldn't be allowed to lease it out like that. What's up, Gemma? Um, oh, Gemma, you fucking... <laughs> Dude, just fucking some doom shit we fucking talked about already today, Gemma. Just some straight doom shit. Hope you're well, though, Gemma. Um, yeah, like, oh, yeah, fuck the landlords entirely, but... Um, mm. Right there. Yeah, like at the bare minimum, they shouldn't be allowed to hold a mortgage and then use their renter to pay off the mortgage while they uh, while they lend uh, end up owning the property and they extract the excess value. Like fuck that. Um No nonsense. I don't fucking check Twitter. What'd you do? Okay, so we talked about the racism, we talked about the Christian infighting, we talked about the Texas raping fucking like 14 year olds with baseball bats. We talked about the cop who was beat his newborn to death and the judge let him out. Let's see, what else did I want to talk about? Oh, um... The um, Sandy Hook family settled with Remington Firearms. First time ever this has occurred. This is this is like big fucking news. Rem Remington settled for seventy three million dollars with the victims of the Sandy Hook school shooting. Uh, oh my god! Nonsense! <laughs> nonsense! Neil Breen is speaking to Mensa. <laughs> oh, God. 
<laughs> oh, this is dude nonsense. I would suspect if I if I didn't know that you were just straight boomer, I'd suspect you made that fucking tweet. That that was like that you literally created that. That was a fake. That's fucking brilliant. <laughs> it's got you written all over it. Oh, uh, Neil's going to be talking to the Mensa Institute. I I would love to fucking see that that speech. Um Oh, this um this was on uh R slash gifts uh a day ago. Um and Let's just say there were interesting reactions. few things to point out Marcus Marcus you've got the eye of an attorney Marcus has got the eye of attorney that was what I was going to point out if you notice the economy of movement that comes with practice it's it's apparent it's apparent she's probably made thousands of those um yes and my favorite comment was the top comment. Are we witnessing child labor? And the f follow up comment was yes. And the follow up comment to that, which I had to scroll down further than I would have preferred to, to find a proper reply to them, was a sarcastic, smarmy response to it that said, now, now, now. We don't necessarily know this is child labor. This could be slavery. And it took me an uncomfortable amount of scrolling to find someone who pointed out slavery is labor. Child labor is slave labor. It's the same thing. Labor and slavery are the same thing. It's slave labor. Right? Like, somebody had to point that out. That's like, e I know you're joking, but, like, you don't even understand, like, you, there's a fundamental misunderstanding of what slavery is. Slavery is labor. Right? Like, that, that was, I was disturbed. I was like, I gotta scroll a ways to find this until somebody understood that, like, it, this joke doesn't even work because slavery is still labor. Right? Like, yeah. But either way, that was um, near the top of all on Reddit um, yesterday. Somebody posted it to GIFs as in like a sort of like, wow, look at this girl fucking make bricks. I can tell you of one location in the U.S. that makes hand-thrown bricks. It is in Pennsylvania, I believe. Um, and they make red clay soil bricks. Um, they are hand thrown, uh, hand thrown, fired clay bricks, and they um, they are literally the only place in the U.S. that manufactures those types of bricks because they are intense. Uh, they are labor intensive. Um, they are not an easy product to make, and the people who make them are some of the hardiest fuckers you will ever meet on the planet. They are survivors of the highest order sort of territory. Um, that, that was like a five-year-old Indian girl. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. 
Um, oh, um, and did everybody see the um, the rate uh, the latest um, um, gamer re moment on Twitter? So this is one of my favorites from the most uh, from like fucking gamer circle jerk re shit that they do. Um, it 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 was so indicative. Of the individuals that were talking about it, it's you know, in that it's in that self-report territory. Can you explain to me why the hell Aloy has a beard? This is someone who's never been close to another human being. This is literally a group that have never encountered a human woman up close. Never once. Not once. They have no idea what a human woman looks like. Yeah. Nice. Good job, Kaiser. Tell me you've never touched a woman without telling me you never touched a woman. Yep. The, the fucking gamer circle jerkery shit that was going off on fucking Twitter about Aloy having peach fuzz like normal human beings do. <laughs> oh, God. Oh. Oh, I just, I just, I just can't. I just can't. Oh, yeah. Okay, um, guys. All right, look. If you've eaten, you know, when I feel bad about myself, I think I'll think of this. Good job at resolution. Um, oh, cupcake. They'll never find that out. Don't worry about it. They'll never find that out. They have to encounter a real human woman. For that to occur, that don't worry. <laughs> their their silicone real girl, well, a real doll won't include that. So don't worry, don't worry too about one bit about that. They'll never find out. Um. Um. <laughs> Jake, if I ever need a waxing, I know who to go to. Um. So, trigger warning. Um. Not safe for work. Not safe for life. It's stream safe. I'm just giving you fair warning. It, once you see this picture, you won't be able to unsee this picture. <laughs> so I just, I, I, I feel it's my duty as a broadcaster, as a streamer, to, to inform you, give you fair warning that what I'm about to show is a deeply disturbing photo <laughs> and there's no turning back once you see it. Um... So here you go. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I feel watched. <laughs> Is this sexual anarchy? Well, where's his lip? I shouldn't have been eating a whole bunch of no. Is this like pre liposuction? Popped out chat. I seen enough of that internet war enough that the internet warning internet warnings are real. <laughs> when the I hate plastic surgeons is this? Oh. Uh, oh yeah, cupcake for sure. Oh cool, a new face for my sleep paralysis demons. I did nonsense. I did. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> caboose. Yeah, caboose. That's my issue with Mark Zuckerberg. The eyes. Am I old enough to see this? <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> Kellyanne Conway and Charlie Kirk, everyone. Oh, oh, oh. 
It's fucked up, right? It's fucked up. It stares into your soul. <laughs> it stares right into your soul. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's Kellyanne. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want Karina, that's right. Uh. <laughs> oh, I just <laughs> It's a genuinely unsettling photo, right? Like it's genuinely unsettling. <laughs> you just sort of stare at it and you're like, "I don't I don't feel good." <laughs> Oh. Is this guy's shit still up? It is. <laughs> See less disturbing gore. Uh. Oh, I forgot to talk about this one too. <laughs> I forgot to talk about this one. Um. An Orange County Sheriff, Deputy Sheriff, who shot a black homeless man during a jaywalking stop won't be facing charges. That's sort of the beginning, middle, and end of that story. I really don't have to talk about it anymore. That's just sort of, I mean, what more do you, what more do you need? Right? Like, Orange County Deputy, uh, Deputy Sheriff was roused in a fucking homeless dude for being homeless. Uh, during a jaywalking stop. By the way, jaywalking is the dumbest goddamn fucking crime we have on the books. It is. It is. What are you, a fucking moron? You're just going to stand there and wait for the dummy light to tell you you can walk? Use your goddamn head. Look both ways and see if there's a fucking car coming. If there isn't, cross the fucking street. And if there is and you get hit, well, that's on you. You now, own, you now like, fucking owe some dude for, like, repairing his car or some shit. Use some goddamn wherewithal and sense, right? Like... Jaywalking is the stupidest fucking crime. And anybody knows the history of it. It's born of the Automobile Association and manufacturers in this country. Blah, 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 blah. Um, but, like, it's, um, but, like, it's the dumbest goddamn fucking crime we have. Who fucking, you just stand there and wait for a light to, to, to change? Honestly. When, my buddy used to live across the street from me. Major Road. I live right across. Um, and we were 0.9 miles away from each other, right? I'd walk and bike to his house all the time, right? And he, um, like there's a, there's a stoplight between us. There's an intersection that I'd, I'd fucking, you know, I'd go there like in the night and there's fucking like, I have to wait for the stupid signal to tell me I can walk. No, you fucking look up and down and you walk across the fucking street. What about loitering? I don't even, just fucking loitering even a crime? <laughs> it's fucking... <laughs> yeah, I suppose loitering has to be on the list. Fair enough. Um, yeah, exactly, Crimson. Um, oh, um, did we talk about this? The 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 truck, the two, the truck carrying two thousand firearms that was um, stolen in Ontario, probably by the trucker convoy or somebody associated with it. Like, did we mention this? Because I know I put it on fucking Discord. But, like, yeah. In Peterborough, uh, Peterborough, Ontario, a truck carrying over 2,000... Oh, fuck yeah, Gemma. Congratulations. Good job. Gemma got in. Uh, got the official tertiary admissions offer to, offer to the music course she's been waiting on. Good fucking job, Gemma. Congratulations. I know you worked hard for that. Um... Yeah, uh, a truck carrying over 2,000 firearms was stolen on Sunday morning. The trucking company called the police um, at like 7.30 a.m. and said their truck is missing. Um, 
firearms, magazines, they don't, this is brilliant, by the way. The trucking company said it involves firearms and clips, magazines, it was magazines, firearms and clips, their quote, um, but they don't believe there was any ammunition on the truck. Thanks. That's reassuring. Um, police say they believe the inc incident is isolated. Even if it is, it's a truck with 2,000 firearms that has just gone missing amidst a little bit of a civil uprising that you're having. Um, nothing. No hot, nor hot, nor uh, no hide, uh, hide nor hair. We have found nothing. They they continue. They have notified other law enforcement agencies across the country and are continuing to investigate the incident. Y'all just had like a truck full of two thousand fucking firearms go poof in the middle of like a civil uprising, and y'all aren't like a little disturbed by this. Like you know what those guns, where those guns are going, right? They're going to like right wing militias. That's obvious where those guns are going. Like, <laughs> like, but hey, apparently it's not a big deal. Um, and then I, oh God, why is that shoulder a little fucky? Um, let's see. Um, Eleni, yeah. Um, do we have Eleni's last name? Eh, hey, we don't need to fucking name Eleni. Um, Eleni is a, 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 a black anarchist activist. Uh, oh, Crystal, the, the gun thing, it was in Petersboro, Ontario. Um, now, Eleni is not my favorite type of anarchist because she's anti-civ. <sighs> Anti-civilization, idiots. I I cannot. I cannot. I just can't. But Eleni is a anti-civ black anarchist in Switzerland and translated, she compiled and translated a series of anarchistic texts so that the Swiss people could read them. It was a 560 page collection of texts by black and non-indigenous uh, and non-black indigenous anarchists because white people are evil and we can't contribute. I get it. Um, but Eleni translated the text from English into German herself and well, Switzerland arrested her and has kept her. Um, she was arrested in beginning of the year around January. She's been denied visits. She's denied letters. She's denied phone calls. She's denied medication and she's denied food in line with her vegan diet. Um, yeah, like I don't have anything beyond that for you. There's, there's literally nothing be in this story beyond that. Eleni is just been arrested and is being indefinitely detained by the Swiss federal government for translating anarchist texts. That's it. That's it. That's this has happened before. Like this has happened before. I, I, I have talked about this before about anarchists being arrested for having literature. This is a thing that happens to us. It's happened in the U.S. It's happened in the U.K. And now I know it's happened in Switzerland as well. Anarchists get arrested solely for possessing literature. 100%. Because German is what they speak in Switzerland. Cassidy. So, yeah, I, it's just par for the chaos. That's odd because usually if you speak German, the only thing the Swiss will hold indefinitely is, uh, is, blood, is your blood covered gold. Yeah, hang on. They speak, Jabba, you know they speak everything. Oh, they 
Hey, Flippy Floppy. You know you're going to get fucking tagged, right? Come March 1st. Uh, th that account is going to get banned. Just so you know. Um, community guidelines policy changes for Twitch usernames, se uh, sexually explicit usernames, or ex uh, explicit drug references in usernames. Grounds for removal of the account. March first, it takes in it takes effect. So there you go. What's up, Puka? Oh, uh, yeah. So there you go. Just thought I'd. Uh, I just thought I'd give you the fair warning. Oh, what else? <sighs> oh, yeah. Um, the Virginia pastor. Uh, what was this guy's name? I forget this guy's name. What's this guy's name? Um, Frank Cop Compton. Frank Compton. It, it is, but it's generally just referred to as, like, Swiss German, Cassidy. My uh, my cousin lives in Switzerland. His fucking, his French Parisian girlfriend speaks, like, six, seven, twelve languages and works as a corporate translator. Um, and, yeah, they live in Switzerland. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just Swiss German. It's just a version of German. Um... <laughs> yeah, um, they do. They speak, dude. It's it's your Euro, it's Europe, Stan. They speak everything. Europe, Stan speaks multitudes of languages. They speak a whole lot of shit. Um, but most of Switzerland speaks speaks Swiss German, so it's sort of the the de facto. Um, so yeah, Frank Compton of Glade Springs, age sixty two. Facing um, 30 felony counts. I'm sure none of these, uh, let's see, it's sexual assaults. I'm sure, I, if I keep reading, right, it, it's not going to mention children, right? Faces 30 fe felony counts of sexual assault, all involve children. Nope, never mind. I was wrong. I, I gave the benefit of the doubt to the, the Christian pastor that he wouldn't be diddling kids. Um, but nope, all 30 felony counts involve children. Um, so yeah, well, mm, color me shocked. Um, Compton was arrested after multiple victims came forward, according to the sheriff's office. The release says that Compton, originally from Maryland, is the current pastor of Faith Interdependent Missionary Baptist Church of Damascus, Virginia. Uh, months long investigation charges include 12 counts of taking indecent liberties with children. <sighs> 12 counts of aggravated sexual battery, three counts of forcible sodomy and three counts of object sexual penetration. He's being held without bond at the Southwest Virginia Regional Jail. Oh. Uh. <laughs> oh, Ash, you weren't even here for the fucking baseball bat story. I mean, to be fair, like, I mean, yeah, like, yeah, that's probably arguably worse, but the, the, the baseball bat story was far more visceral. Um, so, I mean, I can make you hate it even more if you want. Um, eh. so, yeah, <laughs> uh, this one, this one, I do, I kind of, I kind of enjoy this one. I mean, not the, the premise of the story, but you know, the outcome of the story is, not terrible. There's better outcomes. But a former um, <laughs> a former lieutenant with the Miami-Dade Police Department, and everybody knows Miami-Dade Police Department is one of the best police departments in the nation, um, was accused of molesting an underage family member at gunpoint. Uh, by the way, the underage family member was eight. 
just if you if you if that matters to you, if you're like you know fucking, there is a difference between molesting an underage family member who's 16 and an underage family member who's six. You know, if you're one of those people that for some reason have that distinction in your brain, here's your distinction: the family member was eight. Um, he held an eight year old at gunpoint and fucking molested them, right? Um, he's he was facing 48 years in prison. Um due to his lewd and lascivious molestation of a child and also a kidnapping count. Um, well, good old Brolio Gonzalez, age 47, didn't have to wait, wait long to learn his fate either. The entire process of the jury being, imp- uh, being uh, convened and uh, walking off Going all the way back to the uh, to uh, uh, to where they were sequestered, and then coming back, handing the verdict to the judge, and sitting down, and the judge reading it took less than fifteen minutes. The fucking jury, basically, the majority of it was just paperwork. The jury was like, "Yeah, he's fucking guilty. Are we good? Like, do we have him?" I'm I'm sure the fucking jury was looking at that judge like, "Do we even have to leave?" We don't need to deliberate. Like, we could just fill this out right here. This fucker's guilty. <laughs> Less than 15 minutes, the jury's back. Guilty. All counts. Well, that was that. <laughs> oh, fuck you, asshole. Oh, I, you know, I always like to I always like to name and shame these assholes. So let's let's throw uh, good old uh, Brolio Gonzalez up on the screen so everybody can see him. Here is here is a former lieutenant with the Miami Dade police officer who thought it was OK for him to touch an eight year old's vagina, breast and buttocks over and under her clothing while holding her at gunpoint. Lieutenant Gonzalez, everyone. <laughs> uh, Namiki Show, thank you for the raid. Uh, what did y'all get up to? Um, I will be give you fair warning. It has been kind of a doomer stream up until this point. We've been talking about a lot of fucked up topics, uh, a lot of abuses of power, a lot of racist cops. So the, the, room, the mood in the room right now is sort of a gallows humor territory. Just... Be aware what you're walking into. Either way, uh, traditional thumb cop build, straight up. Um, then you have to ask what he's done on duty. Ash, exactly. He did that to a fucking family member. Imagine what he did on duty. Um, <laughs> no, Mickey, uh, what did you guys get up to? How was your stream? And again, thank you for the raid. And by the way, uh, shout out link in chat automatically, everyone. Um... <laughs> Oh, fucking A. Oh, did everybody see the 12 year old fucking rape Matt Walsh thing? Um, no, no, uh, Gemma, I don't believe so. I don't believe so. Dude, Matt Walsh had one of the most like galaxy brain fucking takes ever. I've, I've just ever seen on, on fucking Twitter. It was absolutely astounding. Well, I'll put it on the screen, but we'll also read it, read together. This is just, this is, this is some fucking shit. Holy fuck, man. If a 12 year old is raped by her father and the father takes her to get an abortion, the evidence of the crime will be destroyed and he'll go on molesting his victim for years. If however, the child is born, his crime will be discovered and she will be rescued from the abuse. Is Matt Walsh okay? I mean, I know he's not. I know he's not okay, but like, is Matt Walsh okay? Like this, this seems like, this seems a little troublesome. I, 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 I would, I would be concerned. Does Matt Walsh have children? Do we know if he has children? Because if he has children, like has anybody checked in with the children recently? Cause that's a little concerning. Homeschooled children. Oh, lovely. Oh, love four. Four potentially. Four homeschooled children. Oh, good. Oh, lovely. Uh... 
Bye, Caboose. Bye, Karina. Oh, I've seen that. All right. Don't care. Don't care. Oh, yeah. Um. Any of y'all know about, uh, about America's Army? I'm not asking about the U.S. Army. I'm not asking about America's Army. Does anybody know about America's Army? Because it's getting shut down. After 20 fucking years. Yeah, Gemma, the game. They're shutting it down after 20 years. It's been really successful. It worked. Dude, it worked. It was a successful recruiting tool. But it's out of date and it doesn't do the, the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, they're shutting it down finally. But it worked. It, 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 it fucking worked by all accounts. Which is terrifying to think about. But yeah, yeah, America's Army is getting shut down. Um, the soft plastic squeeze bottles. Yeah, no, Gemma. It was it was designed as a training, uh, a training and recruitment tool. It's straight up like, yeah, it wasn't. It was supposed to be it's disturbing as fuck, but you know, um. Okay, so one, quickly, this is hilarious. Republicans have introduced the Hunter Act. The Hunter Act is an act attempting to ban taxpayer funding crack pipes. God, they're dumb. God, they're fucking dumb. Um... <laughs> Yeah. So that. Um, and then the soft plastic bottles that like this, the, um, the squeeze bottles, like, uh, bicycle, uh, water bottles and shit like that. Right. Um, though, those sorts of like athletic sports bottles sort of territory, the soft squeezable plastic bottles. Um, well, <laughs> researchers at the University of Copenhagen have found that several hundred different chemical substances in tap water um, stored in the reusable plastic bottles. Several of those several hundred are straight up harmful to human health. Um, the University of Copenhagen researchers are calling for manufacturing standards for manufacturers and the chemists behind the studies are straight up saying these are endocrine disruptors and some of them are known insecticides as well, right? Like, oh, by the way, machine washing those, if you put them in the dishwasher, they, they basically, part of their research mimicked how people would, um, potentially reuse and wash the bottles. Um, and they left ordinary tap water in both new and used drinking bottles for 24 hours before, both before and after machine washing, as well as after the bottles had been in the dishwasher and rinsed thoroughly in tap water. Quote, what is released most after machine washing are the soap substances from the surface. Most of the chemicals that come from the water bottle itself remain after wa machine washing and extra rinsing. The most toxic substances that we identified actually came after the bottle had been in the dishwasher. Presumably because washing wears down the plastic and thereby increases leaching, explains postdoctoral researcher and first author, uh, Dr. Selena Tisler of the Department of Plant and Environmental Studies. Um, in new reusable bottles, close to 500 different substances remained in the water after an additional rinse. Over 100 of these substances were tracked to come from the plastic alone. So, you know, that. <sighs> 
And I don't remember if I talked about this, but it feels like, you know, based on the spree I've been on today, um, the Alabama um, student who is Jewish, um, the Alabama school system, um, the, the, the history class, um, the teacher in the history class basically had clan, uh, classmate, clanmates, clanmates, classmates standing, giving stiff armed Nazi salutes during a lesson on the way symbols change. And the, the young, young man, uh, of ethnic and religious, uh, Judaism, uh, Ephraim Titel, um, shared a video and photos of the incident on social media. So, anybody want to guess what happened? Anybody want to guess? Yeah. Um, he was punished. Yeah, the, the, they punished the Jewish kid um, for sharing photos and video of their history class doing Nazi salutes. <laughs> um, quote, They proceeded to tell me I'm making Mountain Brook look bad for uploading the video and sharing it. And to and asked me to apologize to the teacher, which I refused. They, they of course they like yeah, yeah. Um, by the way, now when they go into the class, the teacher requires them all to remove their phones from their pockets or bags and place them on a shelf where they can be seen. They that's they've also gone even further. They're, like, they're trying to ensure that they can't be documented doing this in the future. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> public fair um yeah it, and it should be noted the mountain brook is a city of 22,000 that is listed as virtually all white that's 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 their demographical breakdown in mountain brook literally quote virtually all white <laughs> <laughs> oh god we're fucked god we're fucked i see the hydrate gemma um oh uh public uh fucking history class in arkansas alabama in alabama history class was doing nazi salutes and a jewish kid filmed it and posted it online so what they do they fucking punish the jewish kid instead <laughs> Whoopsie. What's up, Wither? Oh, God. You missed, you missed some doozies of stories at the top of the show, public. I'll tell you that right now. Texas Texas had Texas had a fucking doozy and a half. Midlands, the Midlands Christian School in, in Texas. Woo-wee. <laughs> we had a good minute talking about that one. Uh, sounds about white. Yep. <clears throat> I don't have enough vodka for this stream. Uh, no, cupcake. Not for a minute. Not for a minute did they consider that. Fucking, are you kidding me? Fucking, maybe it's me who's wrong. No, it's the students. And, you know, straight up. Uh, whoopsie doodle. Did we get caught doing an anti-Semitism? I know just how to fix that. Uh... Yeah, in, in all fairness, public, the kids were doing it because of the teacher's commands. <laughs> the history teacher had them doing it. Oh, no, Caleb, not at all. No, it's not a thing we do. Yeah. Well, 
public, the uh, <laughs> the Midlands Christian School had five administrators arrested and perp walked out of the school today because, well, they attempted to cover up the brutal anal raping during a hazing initiation for a freshman on the baseball team in which they beat the shit out of the kid and he attempted to fight back, so they shoved a baseball bat up his ass. And then the five administrators from super un- superintendent down attempted to cover it up. Yeah, they perp walked him. The cops... The kid went, the Children's Advocacy Center and the fucking ER were like, this kid got fucking, I mean, imagine a 14-year-old freshman, right, in a baseball bat dry up the ass, right? Tearing. There had to be tearing. The Children's Advocacy Center Center and the Medical Center were like, uh, <clears throat> police, please? You know, immediately called the cops. The cops, the same day, Fucking called the school, talked to the fucking principal, and the principal said, I'm not answering any questions. Same day, cops show up with a search warrant, search the computers, find that the evidence that they that we had conducted an investigation, they had made it a few days prior. They'd known since January. They found an entire email trail proving that they had fucking, they, they kept the emails. They kept the emails. They, find, they had an entire email chain proving that not only did they know, they attempted to cover it up. So they perp walked the superintendent on down right out the front door, handcuffs and all. I was like, all right. All right. Yeah. Like, Jesus fucking Christ. Oh, and the kid who shoved the baseball bat up his ass also got arrested too. Um, but we don't know his name. Yeah. But yeah, it's how it went down. They fucking locked the door, the locker room, closed, the, uh, turns the lights off, beat the shit out of the kid when he tried to fight back. They told him you're not allowed to fight back, and they held him down and shoved a bat up his ass. We don't know which which end of the bat. But either way, lots of anal tearing. That's how we started the show. Um, and then just lots of fucking stories from there about police abuses and pastor abuses. And it's been a, it's, it's, it, it's been a thing. It's been a thing. Yeah, it's, it's been an interesting run this stream for headlines. <sighs> oh, Ash, it's barely an American school. It's a Christian school. It's a, it's a private Christian school. It's barely an American school. These fuckers are like, yeah, like barely associated with our, our pub, uh, with our educational system. Essentially, if oh God, I'm not going to do the entire rundown history of it, um, the, but the long and short of it is Christian private private Christian schools are an attempt to dodge desegregation and um, are a tax scam as well as a recruitment facility. That's all. Um, yeah, exactly. Public. Yeah, they do. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, fucking what we did, what I did is actually read the press release by the school and then have let people guess what happened. It's the press release is fucking brilliant. We are dedicated to transparency and the physical, spiritual, and emotional well-being of our students is our utmost concern and shit like that. It was like three paragraphs of just absolute fluff bullshit. And I was like, okay, who wants to guess what the fuck happened? Uh, I'm going to start doing that. I'm going to start reading press releases by these f- shitty organizations and let the let chat guess how badly they fucked up and see. <laughs> the The immediate was, did they fuck the kids? That was the go-to. It was like, did they diddle the kids? Uh, <laughs> um, oh, and... I'm not going to name names, but it has been mentioned in chat. Somebody um, actually went to school that we, in the community, um, went to school in that area, and apparently Midlands, if he's allowed to play what, Cassidy? Baseball? Um, member of the community went to school and is familiar with Midlands decades ago, um, and apparently this isn't new for them. This is par for the course. Yeah. Somebody who was familiar with this this area and this school decades ago heard this story 
and their first reaction was, no, that's not new. So there you go. It's probably the first time they perp walked the fucking administration, though. Uh, oh, Project Zomboid? Uh, Cassidy? Uh, P PZ, not PR, but Project Zomboid? Yeah, yeah, Bobby can play if we play. I'm fucking try and take it easy on some arms and shoulders and shit. But if I play later in the stream or right now, if I just dump out, take this as an excuse. Yeah, Bobby's, Bobby's always got an invite. No worries. Um, public, do you play Zomboid? If you if you do play Z uh, Zomboid, you're welcome. We've got a multiplayer game going, and it's not. We've got a base established, so it's 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 an easier start for new players than it would be normally, because well, we're anarchists and we provide. Um. Oh, um, oh yeah, 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 oh yeah, for sure. He's playing Forza and he hates me for it. Um, yeah, yeah, by all means, yeah, he can most assuredly play the PR, uh, the, the press release game. And Forza is amazing. It's amazing. Um, give me one sec. One sec. All right. Um, all right. So, Wallada. And public, by the way, if, if your brain... I finally figured out Project Zomboid... <clears throat> And it was one of the greatest sense of accomplishment, like the EA meme, right? Sense of achievement and accomplishment. Like, you know, we're just trying to provide a sense of accomplishment to players. Figuring Zomboid out and having the systems click and like, oh, I get this game now. Like, I get it. Provided me with a legitimate sense of accomplishment. The game is deep, man. The game is deep. Like, it's deep. <laughs> it's, it's, it's as close to modeling real life as possible. It's crazy deep. Um, like, oh, why is my character gaining or losing weight? Well, have been you watch Have you been watching the macro com uh, components of your diet as you've been eating? Because it's tracking fat, protein, and carbohydrates and total caloric intake. So you know when you have that food, that hunger meter, it's not just hunger. It's tracking a variety of things. Also, it models cold and sickness. It models fucking various injuries. It models. Oh, oh, you want to fucking start a fire? Well, you better have a fuel kindling heat source. Oh, you want to have a cup of tea? Well. You better have a tea bag or tea. You better have a kettle of boiled water. You better have a mug to put the tea bag, uh, the tea in, right? Like how you can make fruit salad using a variety of fruits. You can fucking grow, uh, grow plants. Well, what about mildew? Oh yeah, there's flies in mildew and you might have to prepare, uh, you might have to prepare solutions and spray them on the fucking plant to deal with that. Like it is insanely in depth. It's it's ridiculous how in depth that game is. I, I it never ceases to amaze me. I, I uncover a mechanic, and it's like really, yeah, yeah, they're doing it. It's amazing. Yeah, Kavos, I don't want the farm area. I want like I want access to like some of civilization. Kavos, you're fucking you're a you're a woodspin st style player. I want fucking generators and shit. <laughs> that's it's, that's how we're rolling. But yeah, no, it's it is absolutely no. Uh, then public, you may not enjoy it because Zomboid is the definition of hardcore. Um, it is the definition of hardcore. Okay, now Wolada, I'm not ignoring you. Um, anarcho nihilism, <laughs> newfangled horseless carriages. Anarcho nihilism is not. Uh, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan. The general con the general interpretation of anarcho nihilism is that everything, civilization, society, industrial society, global society, whatever, you know, that all of it um is beyond saving and that the only appropriate response is untempered, unmitigated, 
unleashed, uncontrolled hostility. That is the like, that is the anarcho nihilist pos default position is that nothing is worth saving, nothing is worth fighting for, and we should just burn everything. Uh, no, Cupcake. In fact, that's not Unabomber stuff. Ted Kaczynski was of the opinion that that human species and society could be saved, but post-industrial society had caused a problem and there's ways to fix it. There's ways to roll it back and undo that damage. Ted was not, he was not a nihilist. He was an anti-civilizationist, specifically an anti-industrialist. Um... So, like, that's, yeah, Kaczynski was uh, returned to monkey, or do I understand it wrong? They don't really go so as far as, far as to return to monkey. They don't care. Because it, the nihilistic component of it speaks to a non-objective, uh, uh, there is no objective truth. There is no objective reality. There's nothing that anybody can ever touch or make a salient argument for. So it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. Turn to monkey or not, they don't care usually. It's it, it's it's fuck the people, fuck the world, fuck the problems, fuck shit up. That's the anarcho nihilist position. I find it <sighs> hugely problematic, and generally speaking, um. They tend to prioritize destruction over creation. They believe that um, the, the undesirableness of society and of systems as they stand are so beyond the, the pale, so beyond worth saving, that destruction is the priority rather than creation of, say, mutual aid and affinity group solutions. They feel that any solution that I bring to you, like healthcare access for the community or educational access, is really nothing more than a Band-Aid on, uh, on a sucking chest wound, and that really what we should be doing is putting the patient out of their misery. I, I find them hugely just depressing. Depressing. They're hugely depressing people. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, some sense. Internally, they're usually super... Um, oh, yeah, we talked about that, Caleb. Um, last week, I, I, I put the, the kid's picture on fucking screen and we talked about it. Also, it's not the first time they've done something like that. Um, back in the USSR days, they arrested a fucking, like, 12-year-old or 8-year-old for playing with a cart. And then, like, the cart rolled into the ocean or the, the river. And so they charged him with, like, dis uh, disruption of, like, s the state processes or, like, the people's processes or some shit like that. This isn't even close to the first time Russia has done that sort of shit. Um, yeah, the nihilists tend to be super fucking chill with their internally right they have no internal conflict with it usually because they've let go of that um it's the rest of us who have a vested interest that they see as a weakness they trust me they interpret that as a weakness um but call me stupid call me idealistic see this is my problem is i'm not entirely convinced you can rectify anarchism with nihilism because anarchism is inherently and definitionally falls under the philosophical family tree of idealism and nihilism on the other hand 
rejecting the fundamental those fundamental aspects of the human existence sort of runs counter and contrary to the idealistic tenets of anarchism. So I've always been sort of of the mind that I'm not a hundred percent that we can square this. Yes. Oh no. Idealism. I know. Right. The fucking MLs are losing their minds as we speak. Um, Cause idealism is, I mean, there's subjective and objective idealism at the base level, but idealism is founded upon the idea that human perception is at the core of understanding that like reality is made in the mind. Um, and so like, this is, this is sort of where I suppose there's, well, there's objective, subjective, and there's just transcendental idealism. I suppose, does it get to start? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Kai's doing the fucking philosophy nerd shit. Um, so like Hegel was a fucking German idealist, right? Um, fucking, um, Schopenhauer was a, a German idealist, right? British idealism was more closely related to like existentialism and phenomenonism, I think. Um, but I, I've always had a problem with the concept of anarcho nihilism is, is a philosophical concept because I'm not entirely certain you can square that. That like, cause anarchism is by definition an idealistic philosophical pursuit. And so I'm not sure if the, the, the belief that, um, uh, that, that a rejection of the like fundamental, fundamental aspects of human existence that nihilism builds itself upon can work in concert with that. I suppose the argument, the, the counter argument to me would be that they utilize anarchistic organizing methodologies and by most anarchist definitions, if they use them, then they at least could be in line with them. Seeing as like anti-sivers primitivists utilize anarchistic modalities of operation and we still classify them as anarchists, even though technically... Well, even then, they're not anti-idealist. They're just anti-civilization, and they have a different perspective on. So, again, you're, you're watching me. You're literally watching me, like, work this in my brain live. But I, I'm not entirely sold on the idea that anarcho-nihilism is a thing. I'm not, I'm not 100% sold. I could be sold on it if somebody had a reasoned philosophical argument that they could leverage and put upon me. But as it stands right this moment, I'm not 100% sure anarcho nihilists are anarchists. I'm not 100% sure on that one. But there's, there's, there's the information. <laughs> they all want to lead to Mad Max. Kind of, sort of, yeah. Um, there's a lot of, if you have further questions, um, at Crystal, I, I, Potentially, depending on the group, depending on the individual, depending on y y a few things. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's, again, well, if you have any further questions, feel free to ask. But like that's sort of like m the thoughts off the top of my head pertaining to nihilism and anarchism. And I mean, it, it even depends on like what type of... Um, nihilism it is right are we talking like moral nihilism political nihilism uh, fucking uh, meta uh, metaphysical nihilism um i mean there's like oh god what's that crazy one um there's a crazy one um oh 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 uh, um oh fuck 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 moriological nihilism Moriological nihilism. Moriological nihilism holds the uh, holds the position that life itself does not exist. And this isn't even some like meme fucking ideology. Um, it it is uh, moriological nihilism is like sort of a it, it exists within the like philosophical spaces. Like it's it's that it, life itself doesn't even exist. I I. Nihilism is a weird fucking rabbit hole. It's a weird fucking rabbit hole. Yeah. Mm. 
Beast, I, it would probably depend on the philosopher. I can't speak, uh, you know, with any level of expertise towards moriological nihilism. I think it's got another name, too. Composite nihilism? Compositional nihilism? Either way, moriological nihilism, it's got another name too, it goes by. Either way, um, but yeah, I'm, f I'm surprised I fucking managed to dig out moriological out of my brain. Um, but yeah, um, like metaphysical nihilism is that like non abstract objects don't exist. Uh, no, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, uh, epistemological nihilism is that non abstract objects don't exist. Metaphysical uh, nihilism is that composite objects don't exist and then moriological nihilism is when life itself doesn't exist dude nihilism's crazy as fuck it's crazy as fuck nihilism is crazy as fuck it, it, it's it really is a very weird strain of m metaphysical analysis I mean, not even metaphysical analysis just um fucking um god what would it fall under what would be its <sighs> Philosophy. Yeah, yeah, it would be a family of philosophy unto its own right. It would be one of the trees of philosophy. So. Oh, God. All right. That's. Uh, Moriological. M-O-R-E-O-L-O-G-I-C-A-L. -M Mori. Uh, yeah. M-O-R-E-O. -E I think. Morio. Yeah. Mirio. No, Mirio. Mirio. M-E-R-E-O. Mirio. M-E-R-E-O. It's Miriological, not Moriological. It clicked. Yeah, Miriological. I mean, you know what? Fuck this. Miriological nihilism. Yep, it's M-E-R-E-O. Yeah. Metaphysical thesis that there are no objects with proper parts. Metaphysical symbols. Fucking. You know what? Here, just use the fucking. Yeah, here. There you go. Subheading on nihilism. Gemma, that, that would be my argument for, for and against Sterner. Same argument. Nihilism is to some of the philosophical tendencies as Sterner is to anarchism in that a single drop in the bucket of water is all you need. I think that I think understanding nihilism and knowing that it exists, but not being a nihilist is the way to go because you can utilize it as you have said about understanding that you can define your own meaning and purpose as such that you know if you undermine the the intrinsic or objective purposes in nature to reality that sort of thing and to use it as a sort of um scalpel rather than a, a bludgeon because nihilism at its core is more of a bludgeon but if you turn it into a a scalpel like tool then it's far more effective yeah i think i think like in your bucket of ideology and philosophy a single drop of nihilism is plenty i always conceive it as nihilism is the question and existentialism is the answer <laughs> holy shit isn't there i mean but it's not technically that way because there's existential nihilism isn't there um like there's Hold on. Yeah. Yeah. There's existential nihilism. Sounds kind of gay science-y. <laughs> it is. Um, so, yeah, there's this one of the... I just wanted to double check one of the subsets of uh, nihilism, right? Like, there's existential, there's... Uh, oh, God. Fuck. Um, there's existential, there's moral, there's political, there's epistemological, there's metaphysical, and then there's eh, whatever. Either way. Um, simulation theory could be a practical realization of existential nihilism. Fair enough. 
I'm a nihilism nihilist. I don't care whether there's, there's a point. <laughs> um, and I mean, nihilism is very much postmodern as well. I mean, it predates postmodernism, but it's very post post. I suppose I should invert the or invert that right. Postmodernism is very nihilistic. Um, so yeah. I, I, and I'm not a fan of postmodernism, so. All right, that's enough philosophy. <laughs> that's enough philosophy. <laughs> I'm sorry. It just, it just is. Once you go down that rabbit hole, I, you know, sometimes there's no coming back either. Um, <laughs> there's, there's, there, there's no coming back from that one. Um, Yeah, there it is. Baudrillard, uh, Baudrillard uh, had uh, characterized postmodernity as a nihilistic epoch. Yeah. Um, I, I, I still am not sold on the idea that you can be an anarchist and a nihilist at the same time. I'm not sold on it. I, like I said, I, I worked that out for you live in my brain. I'm not sure you can square the idealist school of thought with the nihilist school of thought. Maybe you can. Maybe there's a, a philosopher out there who synthesized these concepts that I just haven't read and I'm not aware of that could clarify it for me. But if, as it stands, I'm not. I'm not sold. Um, so, well, we did all of the doom headlines. We worked our way through some bullshit fucking um oh god that shoulder is just god i hope i didn't fucking tweak it when i was working out um yeah. do i want to read theory is the question how many pages Uh, 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 oh, I don't know. All right. Let's do it. We'll do some theory read. <clears throat> um, oh, first off, you know what? I'll be right back. I need to get more water because Gemma told me to hydrate ages ago and I still haven't.
There you go, Crystal. I just queued it off for you. All right. Let us... Let us read some Bob Black. <clears throat> What's up, Ask? Um... I mean, you know. Oh, I'm not re I'm not recording then. I'm not reading. Wither. Optics matter. I don't mind goofing around for you guys, but the fact of the matter is if like my theory videos on YouTube, I'm not gonna fucking wear bunny ears for them. That's that's or some goofy ass shit. I I'm I just it's optics matter. We have to accept that as leftists. We have to accept that as just people. So I'll put I'll put them on, but we're not doing theory reads yet. So no reading with bunny ears. Yeah, sorry. So what else are we gonna do? Um, dude, public, dude, public. My rant yesterday. Um. Uh, first hour, hour and a half of my stream. Yeah. Messaging amongst leftists, prioritization of things that matter and things that don't matter, how to speak to the areas we abandoned. Um, yeah. Telling you, I fucking went off. Uh, Dirtling... They do. They do public. And it's a problem. It's a problem. Um, I, I, yeah, I watched it happen live on the stream last night. I fucking, I was literally lecturing a fucking room full of people on this matter. And somebody came in with a shit Ukraine take. And two people tried to time him out immediately. Um, I was like, this is what we're talking about. Like, this is literally what I'm talking about. Let's have the conversation. Let's talk to this dude. And by the time I was done, I laid out the demographical analysis and the d dictator's dilemma and a variety of things. And the guy said, I've never heard any of this before. You've given me a lot to think about. And then he left. It's what it fucking looks like. It's literally what it looks like. It's, that's the process. Like, that's like, yeah. Like, I can't, I can't change his mind in a day. But I planted a fucking seed successfully by the looks of it. And like, yeah, like half the fucking conversation. Yeah, the guy's got a problematic name and he's got some stupid takes, but he's still a human, right? Like, aren't we supposed to be like humanistic and humane on the left? But it seems not many leftists are too concerned with that these days. So, yeah, yeah, I, I, I was on a tear last night. I, I fucking, yeah. And then the talk with Radhom at the end was really good, too. So. It seems, it seems, a public, I know, it's, it seems obvious, it seems like common sense, but common sense doesn't seem that common. So, I don't know what to say about it. But, yeah, like, it, it just, it, it bums me out that the, I, and this is another bullet I bit last night. Um... The left has better models of reality. I'm sorry. The right has better models of reality than the left. And we can base this on the fact that their predictive analysis of human behavior patterns and um, methods of manipulation of voting groups is effective. Their results speak for themselves. And somebody was like, well, they use fear. I'm like, does the fear map onto the human experience correctly? Yeah. Does it work? Yes then their model is more effective. And I, I just, I'm like, it's, we have to start understanding these things as leftists. Like we're, we're fighting the wrong battles in the wrong ways using incorrect models of reality. And it's just kicking our own asses. Yeah, exactly, public, exactly. Fucking like, the right isn't the biggest enemy of the left. The left is the biggest enemy of the left. We're our own worst enemy. 
in no way, shape, or form does the right pose a threat. It's a, it's us. We can, we fucking constant. We were that, we're that meme of the dude sticking the fucking stick through the stokes of the bicycle and then cursing the heavens because of it. Ah. Hey, you're welcome and thank you. Like it, it's the left is the biggest problem on the left. It really is. It's astounding. Some days the shit I witness. Like, like, yes. Yeah, I mean, not even unified public, like forget unification. We walked out of the spaces that we had unified, right? Like workers movements, labor movements. Dude, we created that. The fucking workers movements are ours. They're ours. They're wholly our creation and property. Like that's, that's, we fucking built that shit. That is the commons as we come to understand it. We constructed that shit. We literally just fucked off and just left all of the quote unquote blue collar workers or laborers just absolutely ripe for the picking for all those alt-right douchebags. It is astounding sometimes when you look back at the shit we absolutely forso forsaked in, 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 for what reason? For what reason? Uh, how many times do we have to tell people to read rules for radicals? I don't, for Cassie, I don't fucking know. How many fucking times I have to say, read this fucking book, people. <sighs> Listen to the audiobook. Read the book. Do whatever you got to do to get through that book. But you need to comprehend rules for radicals. Um, also, I'm looking for really good uh, rhetoricians books uh, and uh, like in lectures right now. I'm going to try and get a group of... Um, of experts on uh, on rhetorical device that understand how to make persuasive arguments. I'm gonna put those together and so the community has those as well on tap. Yeah, I, I, I think that we need to start teaching people for, uh, Cassie, I'm gonna deprioritize journalistic integrity. I'm gonna pri re, uh, prioritize a rhetorical device and re uh, understanding of rhetoric because we need to start I, I, I legitimately would. Vosh is an excellent rhetorician. Yeah, that is the one thing I don't think anybody can ever take from Vosh. And if you attempt to, you're acting in bad faith. You just hate Vosh, right? For a variety of reasons. Vosh is an excellent rhetorician. There's no way around that. And if you, if you think otherwise, well, fuck you. I don't know what to do with that. They really hate Vosh. They do public. Like, Vosh derangement syndrome is a thing. They, people really hate Vosh. They really fucking hate Vosh. I mean, thank you. And I, I don't think I do. I, I just, you know, in discussion with Vosh, right? Like, you know, yeah, he's an excellent rhetorician. Um, I know I'm, I'm halfway decent at it, too. Um, but you know, yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to do some more formalized study at like the, the postdoctoral sort of level. Um, there's a couple of people that are like professors that I've got eyes on that I kind of want to study their works because they've, they've spoken on it at, at length. Um, and I'd, I'd like to know some of the more technical details behind the scenes from like a collegiate level down, like top down view of rhetoric. Um, David Brooks, is he? No, he's not the guy I was thinking of. Duly noted, though. <clears throat> um. Yeah, yeah, public. GL, you have Vosh derangement syndrome then. If you think Vosh is the biggest enemy of the left, homie. 
homie. <laughs> I, don't even, I don't know where to start with that. If you think Vosh is the biggest enemy of the left, wow. That's, I mean, you could make an argument that he's, I mean, oof. It is public. Yeah, the hate boner is crazy. Um, you'd have to give me an example of it, GL. You'd have to give me an example. Because I don't actively watch Fosh. Oh, Luna Oi is fucking terrible. Oh, she's terrible. Uh, milk from PA. Fuck, fuck milk. Um, and yeah, Jimmy Dore doesn't even count. Jimmy Dore is not even good at like anything. What is, what is Jimmy Dore good at? He was a milk toast mediocre comedian. Like he he was he was a better comedian than he is a political commentator, and I'd prefer him to go back to his as I said milk to toast mediocre comedy. Um, he was like a stoner comic with like Doug. Um, um, Getting high with Doug. Which fucking Doug is that? Benson. Doug Benson. He was like a fucking to a sto uh, to a stoner comic with fucking Doug Benson. Um, yeah, like... That's... He'd be better off going back to that for me. Um, but I'm serious, Jill. Like, if you've got an example of him doing that, by all means. Uh, not a fan of... My Dude, who's a fan of Mike from PA? Fucking fuck Mike from VA. Fuck that guy. <laughs> like that guy is that guy is terrible. He's terrible on so many levels. <laughs> He's just not a good person. Everybody fucking as soon as you mention Mike from PA, everybody in the room immediately goes, fuck Mike from PA. No one likes that dude. It is astounding how much hate that dude actually has. Yeah, guys, fucking Jesus. Mike from PA is better than Vosh. All right, GL, that's fu all right, uh, come on, homie. Come on. Come on, man. That's some VDS if there ever was. Uh, like, really? The guy who openly admits that he doesn't want anything to get better because it would cause his sub count to go down and cause his channel viewership to decrease. The guy who literally admits he's capitalistically, capitalistically motivated to keep problems going because it's good for viewership. I mean, Vosh has said some shit in bad faith, I'm sure, but holy fuck, man. Mike from PA is like, yeah, let the world burn. It's good for my channel. That's a different level. That's a different level. Like, that's a callousness that is fucking crazy. Oh, yeah. Well, Lada, it's crazy, right? It's absolutely crazy how many views uh, fucking Milk gets. Oh, ages ago now, Fire. Like, well, a year and a half, two years, some shit like that? It's been a while. It's been a while since he said that. <laughs> fucking Milk. Uh, calling Jimmy Dore is a lef uh, leftist is like calling Donald Trump a level-headed decision maker. <laughs> oh man, these people are just. Uh, what did uh... wait? What did Gemma say? Was Gemma? I didn't see Gemma respond to something. No, I think public just tagged the wrong person. That's all. <laughs> Um. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jimmy Dore. Uh. Um. Fucking Jimmy Dore was the one who was platforming the Boogaloo Boys and said that like, um. Oh, they don't seem that bad. Yeah, Jimmy. Jimmy Dore is that dude. At least you're not completely batshit, Gio. <laughs> Um, yeah, it is. Yeah, Vosh is a, Vosh is a skilled rhetorician. Um, 
I think I need, yeah, you think I need to read rules for radicals as a series? Oh, it's so, it's so big though. Like, I mean, I know it's not big compared to some of the other shit, but for reading out loud, oh, it's so big. Ugh, God. It would take forever. What is it, like 200 pages? Buck 90 something. Buck 96. Yeah. Uh. Alright, I'll consider it. I consider it. You're right. I need to. But you know what? We've already started Bob Black. So we might as well. Oh, we're never getting through this. <laughs> Fuck it. This is. We might as well start Rules for Radicals. You know what? Let's start Rules for Radicals. <laughs> uh, oh, I can never say fucking. I can never say his fucking name. What is that dude's name? Is it. Is it Tuck, it, Tocqueville? 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 What, 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 how the fuck do I. Somebody give me a phonetic pronunciation of fucking Tocqueville's fucking name. Tuck, Tocqueville? Um. Fucking the first one. It's Tocqueville. It's literally just Tocqueville. Jesus Christ. Fucking French. <laughs> French need to get their shit together. That's all I'm saying. Their names are obnoxious to pronounce. At least they're not Polish. All right. You know what? Fair, fair, fair. You know what? Fair. Okay. Yeah. The French names are obnoxious, but at least you can sort of feel your way through them. Fucking Polish names. You're like, I don't even know what the fuck this is. So, <clears throat> all right. Um, I mean, Corey, it's just, it's a lot of fucking work doing audiobooks. It's a lot of fucking work doing audiobooks. It really is. Uh, please do not feel your way through a Frenchman. <laughs> um, ask. Yeah. Also, it's right wingers. If you don't think that the likes of Charlie Kirk and Ben Shapiro haven't read Rules for Radicals, read Rules for Radicals and then watch Ben Shapiro. You're like, this is out of the book. Watch f fucking Hillary Clinton and watch an Obama campaign. Read the book. This is out of Rules for Radicals. Watch the Catholic Church. Newman Leary is, is, an, uh, is on account number four, by the way. Um, I've just banned him again. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Newman Leary. In a chat message. Evading a block ban. Site-wide ban from Twitch. Newman Leary. Newman Leary one. Newman... Leary 2, Newman Leary 3, Jesus Christ, this dude has more accounts than a Chinese click farm. Do something about it, losers. There we go. And there we go. Oh, yeah. Well, I've already filed the report. Too late. Uh, <laughs> no public. Trust me. It's the same dude. It's the same white nationalist racist piece of shit. Um, fucking. Yeah, this dude's got a fucking blog and a half. It's we've read it. We've read it on air. The dude's he's a oh, yeah, he's a he's a piece of work. He's a piece of work. <clears throat> All right. I need to turn off the alerts and shit. Give me a second. We're going to we're going to kill the alerts. If we're going to do this, we're going to do this proper. So, give me a second. Can I turn off a general See, he's, he's just here to disrupt. That's, that's his entire fucking cause. 
Um, I will purge that follow from my list, Newman. I'm not kidding you. Uh, you know what? I'm going to do it right now. Watch this. I, I'm literally going to purge your follow from my followers list. No. Cupcake. Um, Cupcake, I think we're going to do rules for radicals. Um, no, you cannot. Um, we've got, we've got like 250 pages, um, in, in Bob Black still. And you know what? I'm going to get the rules for radicals, uh, going, uh, f instead. And there we go. And let's sort it by that. <laughs> Interesting. Just just sorted it the other direction. All right, there we go. Um <clears throat> Oh, alerts. Alerts. What I was doing before I dealt with fucking dummy. All right, follows off, subscriptions off, hosts off. And raids. Oh, you know what? I should do bits as well, just in case. Off. Done. Um, and then where's my alerts? Bot overlay alerts. There we go. <clears throat> uh, rules for radicals is, well, it's a pragmatic primer for realistic radicals. Saul Alinsky is one of the most effective community organizers and political activists of the previous century. Um, the long and short of it is oh, Barack Obama and the Catholic Church both recognize Saul Alinsky as quite potentially the most effective community organizer and political activist they've ever known. Barack Obama credits uh, Saul Alinsky with teaching him how to organize a political campaign and get a grassroots movement going so that he could gain support and get his, uh, get his senatorial office and then his presidential campaign uh, a, uh, actually see, be successful. The, ca uh, the Chicago diocese, the Chicago Catholic diocese, would send graduating priests who were going to locations, who were going to be sent on mission to locations that were particularly um, either violent, disturbed, disruptive, um, that had social ills and problems. They would send them to Saul Alinsky to teach them how to be the most effective community organizer and activist that they could have. Saul Alinsky was sort of an equal opportunity. He would teach anybody who was willing to learn. Um, he, he is quite possibly the most effective political organizer and activist that may have ever existed. And he didn't really do it himself. He taught people how to do it. Um, this is why you see the book as a requisite for all radicals. I see the, I see the book as a prerequisite for everyone, everyone. If you want to be politically active, if you want to engage in community organizing, if you want to set up mutual aid networks, if you want to understand how to interact with people and get shit done, why haven't you read Rules for Radicals? If you want to disrupt systems, why haven't you read for Rules for Radicals? If you want to run a political activism campaign that upends the status quo, why haven't you read Rules for Radicals? Like, this book is a prerequisite for so much. And when you look at who has used this knowledge successfully, you start to understand the power of this knowledge. I mean, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama both acknowledge Saul Alinsky as teaching them how to community organize. But when you start adding in groups like the Catholic Diocese to that list, you're like, oh shit, he really does know what the fuck he's talking about, doesn't he? Like when the Catholics are sending you priests to, to teach them. Like, yeah, that's an organization that takes shit seriously. It's literally the manual for community organizing. It is. And you can see it's beat the fuck up. You can see my copy here. I take good care of books, but this copy is beat the fuck up. It's got tabs galore. It's got highlights all throughout it. Fucking it's constantly highlighted. 
I, I have this copy has been through shit with me. <laughs> like it's been through shit. I think some of the water, the the page curling from the water, may have been a fire hose. Either way, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> um. So yes. So let's read rules for radicals. Or let's start. We're by no means going to finish. <clears throat> uh, all right. Rules for radicals. A pragmatic primer for realistic radicals by Saul D. Olinsky. Well, I'm not going to read all of the personal acknowledgements and dedications. There is one that I, I think I should honor. Well, there's two that I think I should honor based on the wishes of the man himself. Um, one is the entirety of the book dedication is to Irene. Um, I think it matters that we keep that in per his own wishes. But one of the most important dedications <laughs> in the book uh, one of the quotes that's included amongst Rabbi Hillel and Thomas Paine. Um, we'll go down the list. Rabbi Hillel, where there are no men, be thou a man. Thomas Paine, let them call me rebel and welcome. I feel no concern from it, but I should suffer the misery of devils were I to make a whore of my soul. And then Saul Alinsky himself. Lest we forget at least an over-the-shoulder acknowledgement to the very first radical. From all our legends, mythology, and history, and who is to know where mythology leaves off and history begins, or which is which. The first radical known to man who rebelled against the establishment and did it so effectively that he won his own kingdom. Lucifer. Prologue. The revolutionary force today has two targets, moral as well as material. Its young protagonists are one moment reminiscent of the idealistic early Christians, yet they also urge violence and cry, burn the system down. They have no illusions about the system, but plenty of illusions about the way to change our world. It is to this point that I have written this book. These words are written in desperation, partly because it is what they do and will do that will give meaning to what I and the radicals of my generation have done with our lives. They are now the vanguard, and they had to start almost from scratch. Few of us survived the Joe McCarthy Holocaust of the early 50s, and of those were there even fewer whose understanding and insights had developed beyond the dialectical materialism of orthodox Marxism. My fellow radicals who were supposed to pass on the torch of experience and insights to a new generation were just not there. As the young looked at the society around them, it was all, in their words, materialistic, decadent, bourgeois in its values, bankrupt, and violent. Is it any wonder that they rejected us in toto? Today's generation is desperately trying to make some sense out of their lives and out of the world. Most of them are products of the middle class. They've rejected their materialistic backgrounds, the goal of a well-paid job, suburban home, automobile, country club membership, first-class travel, status, security, and everything that meant success to their parents. They have had it. They watched it lead their parents to tranquilizers, alcohol, long-term endurance marriages or divorces, high blood pressure, ulcers, frustration, and the disillusionment of the good life. They have seen the almost unbelievable idiocy of our political leadership in the past political leaders, ranging from the mayors to governors to the White House, were regarded with respect and almost reverence. Today, they're viewed with contempt. This negativism now extends to all institutions, from the police and the courts to the system itself. We are living in a world of mass media which daily exposes society's innate hypocrisy, its contradictions, and the apparent failure of almost every facet of our social and political lives. 
The young have seen their activist participatory democracy turn into its antithesis, a nihilistic bombing and murder. The political panaceas of the past, such as the revolutions in Russia and China and France, have become the same old stuff under a different name. The search for freedom does not seem to have any road or destination. The young ones are inundated with a barrage of information, in fact, so overwhelming that the world has come to seem an utter bedlam, which has them spinning in a frenzy, looking for what man has always looked for from the beginning of time, a way of life that has some meaning or sense. A way of life means a certain degree of order where things have some relationship and can be pieced together into a system that at least provides some clues as to what life is about. Men have always yearned for and sought direction by setting up religions, inventing political philosophies, creating scientific systems like Newton's, or formulating ideologies of various kinds. This is what is behind the common cliché, getting it all together. Despite the realization that all values and factors are relative, fluid, and changing, and that it'll be possible to get it all together only relatively. The elements will shift and move together just like the changing patterns in a turning kaleidoscope. In the past, the world, whether in its physical or intellectual terms, was much smaller, simpler, and more orderly. It inspired credibility. Today, everything is so complex as to be incomprehensible. Today, everything is so complex. <laughs> what sense does it make for men to walk on the moon while other men are waiting on welfare lines or in Vietnam killing and dying for a corrupt, di corrupt dictatorship in the name of what? Freedom? These are the days when man has his hands on the sublime while he is up to his hips in the muck of madness. The establishment, in many ways, is as suicidal as some of the far left, except that they're in infinitely more destructive than the far left can ever be. The outcome of the hopelessness and despair is morbidity. There's a feeling of death hanging over the nation. Today's generation faces all this and says, I don't want to spend my life the way my family and their friends have. I want to do something to create, to be me, to do my own thing, to live the older generation doesn't understand and worse, doesn't want to. I don't want to be just a piece of data to be fed into a computer or a statistic in a public opinion poll, just a voter carrying a credit card. To the young, the world seems insane and falling apart. On the other side is the older generation, whose members are no less confused if they're not as vocal or conscious, it may be because they can escape to a past where the world was simpler. They can still cling to the old values in the simple hope that everything will work out somehow, some way. That the younger generation will straighten out with the passing of time. Unable to come to grips with the world as it is, they retreat in any confrontation with the younger generation with that infuriating cliche, when you get older, you'll understand. One wonders at their reaction if some youngsters were to reply, when you get younger, which will never be, then you'll understand. So, of course, you'll never understand. Those of the older generation who claim a desire to understand say, when I talk to my kids or their friends, I'll say to them, look, I believe what you have to tell me is important and I respect it. You call me a square and say that I'm not with it or I don't know where it's at or I don't know where the scene is and it's all the rest of the words you use. Well, I'm going to agree with you. So suppose you tell me, what do you want what do you mean when you say, I want to do my own thing? What the hell is your thing? When you say you want a better world, like what? And don't tell me a world of peace and love and all the rest of that stuff because people are people. And as you'll find out when you get older, I'm sorry, I didn't really mean to say anything about when you get older. I really do respect what you have to say. Now, why don't you answer me? Do you know what you want? Do you know what you're talking about? Why can't we get together? And this, that is what we call the generational gap. What the present generation wants is what all generations have always wanted. A meaning. A sense of what the world and life are. And a chance to strive from some sort of order. 
if the young were now writing our Declaration of Independence, they would begin when in the course of inhuman events. And their bill of particulars would range from Vietnam to our black Chicano and Puerto Rican ghettos to the migrant workers, to Appalachia, to the hate, to the ignorance, disease, and starvation in the world. Such a bill of particulars would emphasize the absurdity of human affairs and the forlornness and emptiness, the fearful loneliness that comes from not knowing if there is any meaning to our lives. When they talk of values, they're asking for a reason. They're searching for an answer, at least for a time, to man's greatest question. Why am I here? The young react to their chaotic world in different ways. Some panic and run, rationalizing that the system is going to collapse anyway of its own rot and corruption, and so they're copping out. Going hippie or yippie, taking drugs, trying communes, anything to escape. Others went for pointless, sure-loser confrontations so that they could fortify their rationalization and say, well, we tried and did our part, and they copped out too. Others, sick with guilt and not knowing where to turn or what to do, went berserk. These were the weathermen and their like. They took the grand cop out. Suicide. To these, I have nothing to say or give but pity. And in some cases, contempt for such as those who leave their dead comrades and take off for Algeria or other points. What I have to say in this book is not the arrogance of unsolicited advice. It is the experience and counsel that so many young people have questioned me about through all-night sessions of, on hundreds of campuses in America. It is for those young radicals who are committed to the fight, committed to life. Remember, we're talking about revolution, not revelation. You can miss the target by shooting too high as well as too low. First, there are no rules for revolutions anymore than there are rules for love or rules for happiness. But there are rules for radicals who want to change their world. There are certain central concepts of action in human politics that operate regardless of the scene or the time. To know these is basic to a pragmatic attack on the system. These rules make the difference between being a realistic radical and being a rhetorical one who uses the tired old words and slogans like calling the police pig or white fascist racist or just motherfucker and has so stereotyped themselves that others react by saying, oh, he's one of those. And then promptly turn off. This failure of many of our younger activists to understand the art of communication has been disastrous. Even the most elementary grasp of the fundamental idea that one communicates within the experience of their audience and gives full respect to the other's values would have ruled out attacks on the American flag. The responsible organizer would have known that it's the establishment that has betrayed the flag while the flag itself remains the symbol of America's hopes and aspirations and they would have conveyed this message to their audience. On another level of communication, humor is essential. For through humor, much is accepted that would have been rejected if presented seriously. This is a sad and lonely generation. It laughs too little, and this, too, is tragic. For the real radical, doing his thing is to do the social thing for and with people. In a world where everything is so interrelated that one feels helpless to know where or how to grab, hold, and act, defeat sets in. For years, there have been people who have found society too overwhelming and have withdrawn, concentrated on doing their own thing instead. Generally, we've put them into mental hospitals, diagnosed them as schizophrenics, if the real radical finds that having long hair sets up psychological barriers to communication and organization, they cut their hair. If I were organizing in an Orthodox Jewish community, I would not walk in there eating a ham sandwich unless I wanted to be rejected so I could have an excuse to cop out. My thing, if I want to organize, is solid communication with the people in the community. Lacking communication, I am, in reality, silent. 
Throughout history, silence has been regarded as assent, and in this case, assent to the system. As an organizer, I start from where the world is, as it is, not as how I would like it to be. That we accept the world as it is does not in any sense weaken our desire to change it into what we believe it should be. It is necessary to begin where the world is if we're going to change it to what we think it should be. That means working in the system. There's another reason for working inside the system. Dostoevsky said that taking a new step is what people fear most. Any revolutionary change must be preceded by passive, affirmative, non-challenging attitude towards change among the mass of our people. They must feel so frustrated, so defeated, so lost, so futureless in the prevailing system that then, then they're willing to let go of the past and chance the future. This acceptance is the reformation essential to any revolution. To bring on this reformation requires that the organizer work inside the system. Among not only the middle class, but the 40% of American families, more than 70 million people whose income ranges from 5000 to 10000 a year. They cannot be dismissed by labeling, labeling them blue collar or hard hat or low skilled they will not continue to be relatively passive and slightly challenging, uh, challenging if we fail to communicate with them, if we don't encourage them to form alliances with us, they will move to the right. Maybe they will anyway, but let's not let it happen by default. Our youth are impatient with the preliminaries that are essential to purposeful action. Effective organization is thwarted by the desire for instant and dramatic change, or, as I've phrased it elsewhere, the demand for revelation rather than revolution. It's the kind of thing we see in playwriting. The first act introduces the characters in the plot. In the second act, the plot and characters are developed as the play strives to hold the, attention, uh, the audience's attention. In the final act... Good and evil have their dramatic confrontation and resolution. The present generation wants to go right into the third act, skipping the first two, in which case there is no play. Nothing but confrontation for confrontation's sake. A flare-up and back to darkness. To build a powerful organization takes time. It is tedious, but that's the way the game is played. If you want to play and not just yell, kill the umpire. What is the alternative to working inside the system? A mess of rhetorical garbage about burn the system down. Some yippee yells, do it or do your own thing. What else? Bombs, sniping, silence when police are killed or screams of murdering fascist pigs when others are killed, attacking and baiting the police, public suicide. Power comes out of the barrel of a gun is an absurd rallying cry when the other side has all the guns. Lenin was a pragmatist. Truth. When he returned to what was then Petrograd from exile, he said that the Bolsheviks stood for getting power through the ballot, but would reconsider after they got the guns. Militant mouthings? Spouting quotes from Mao, Castro, and Che Guevara? Which are as germane to our highly technological, computerized, cybernetic, nuclear-powered mass media society as a stagecoach on a jet runway at Kennedy Airport. Let us, in the name of radical pragmatism, not forget that in our system, with all its repressions, we can still speak out and denounce the administration, attack its policies, work to build an opposition, uh, oppositional political base. True, there is government harassment, but there still is that relative freedom to fight. I can attack my government, try to organize to change it. There's more than, uh, that's more than I can do in Moscow, Peking, or Havana. Remember, the reaction of the Red Guard to the Cultural Revolution and the fate of the Chinese college students? Remember that. Just a few of the violent episodes of bombings or a courtroom shootout that we've experienced here would have resulted in a sweeping purge and mass executions in China, Russia, or Cuba. Let's keep some perspective, shall we? 
We will start with the system because there is no other place to start from except political lunacy. It is most important for those of us who want revolutionary change to understand that revolution must be preceded by reformation. It's just how things work. To assume that a political revolution can survive without, supporting, uh, without the supporting base of a popular reformation is to ask for the impossible in politics. Men don't like to step abruptly out of the security of familiar experience. They need a bridge to cross from their own experience to a new way. A revolutionary organizer must shake up the prevailing patterns of their lives, agitate, create disenchantment and discontent with the current values to produce, if not a passion for change, at least a passive, affirmative, non-challenging climate. Quote, the revolution was effected before the war commenced, John Adams wrote. The revolution was in the hearts and minds of the people. This radical change in the principles, opinions, sentiments, and affections of the people was the real American revolution, end quote. A revolution without a prior reformation collapses or becomes totalitarian tyranny. A reformation means the masses of our people have reached the point of disillusionment with past ways and values. They don't know what will work, but they do know that the prevailing system is self-defeating, frustrating, and hopeless. They won't act for change, but they won't strongly oppose those who do. The time is then ripe for revolution. Those who, for whatever combination of reasons, encourage the opposite of reformation, becoming the unwitting allies of the far political right. Parts of the far left have gone so far in the political circle that they're now all but indistinguishable from the extreme right. It reminds me of the days when Hitler, new on the scene, was excused for his actions by humanitarians on the grounds of a paternal rejection and childhood trauma. When there are people who espouse the assassination of Senator Robert Kennedy or the Tate murders or the Marin County Courthouse kidnapping and killings or the University of Wisconsin bombing and killings as revolutionary acts, then we're dealing with people who are merely hiding psychosis behind a political mask. The masses of people recoil with horror and say, our way is bad and we were killing to let it change, but... Certainly not for this murderous madness. No matter how bad things are now, would they're better than that? So they begin to turn back. They regress into acceptance of a coming massive repression in the name of law and order. In the midst of the gassing and violence of the Chicago Police and National Guard during the 1968 Democratic Convention, many students asked me, do you still believe we should try to work inside our system? These were students who had been with Eugene McCarthy in New Hampshire and followed him across the country. Some had been with Robert Kennedy when he was killed in Los Angeles. Many of the tears that were shed in Chicago were not from gas. Mr. Olinsky, we fought in primary after primary, and the people voted on, on no on Vietnam. Look at that convention. They're not paying any attention to the vote. Look at your police and the army. You still want us to work within the system. It hurt me to see the American army with drawn bayonets advancing on American boys and girls. But the answer I gave the young radicals seemed to me the only realistic one. Do one of three things. One, go find a wailing wall and feel sorry for yourselves. Two, go psycho and start bombing. But this will only swing people to the right. Three, learn a lesson. Go home, organize, build power, and at the next convention, you be the delegates, you be in charge, you be the ones with the power. Remember, once you organize people around something as commonly agreed upon as, say, pollution, and then organize people, uh, and then an organized people is on the move. From there, it's a short and natural step to political pollution, to Pentagon pollution. It's not enough just to elect candidates. You must keep pressure on. Radicals should keep in mind Franklin D. Roosevelt's response to a reform delegation. Okay, you've convinced me. Now go on out and bring pressure on me. 
Action comes from keeping the heat on. No politician can sit on a hot issue if you make it hot enough. As for Vietnam, I'd like to see our nation be the first in history of man to publicly say we were wrong. What we did was horrible. We got in and kept getting in deeper and deeper, and at every step we invented new reasons for staying. We have paid part of the price in 44,000 dead Americans. There is nothing we can ever do to make it up to the people of Indochina or to our own people, but we will try. We believe that our world has come of age and so it is no longer a sign of weakness or defeat to abandon a childish pride and vanity, to admit we were wrong. Such an admission would shake up the foreign policy concepts of literally all nations and open the door to a new international order. This is our alternative to Vietnam. Anything else is the old makeshift patchwork. If this were to happen, Vietnam may even have been somewhat worth it. A final word on our system. The democratic ideal springs from the ideas of liberty, equality, majority rule through free elections, protection of the rights of minorities, and freedom to subscribe to multiple loyalties in matters of religion, economics, and politics rather than to a to total loyalty to the state. The spirit of democracy is the idea of importance and worth in the individual and faith in the kind of world where the individual can achieve as much as their potential as possible. Great dangers always accompany great opportunities. The possibility of destruction is always implicit in the act of creation. Thus, the greatest enemy of individual freedom is the individual themselves. From the beginning, the weakness as well as the strength of the democratic ideal has been the people. People cannot be free unless they are willing to sacrifice some of their interests to guarantee the freedom of others. The price of democracy is the ongoing pursuit of the common good by all of the people. 135 years ago, Tocqueville, uh, Tocqueville gravely warned that unless individual citizens were regularly involved in the action of governing themselves, self-government would pass from the scene. Citizen participation is the animating spirit and force in a society predicated on volunteerism. We are not here concerned with people who profess the democratic faith but yearn for the dark security of dependency where they can be spared the burden of decision. Reluctant to grow up or incapable of doing so, they want to remain children and be cared for by others. Those who can should be encouraged to grow. For the others, the fault lies not in the system, but in themselves. Here, we are desperately concerned with the vast mass of our people who thwarted through the lack of interest or opportunity or both do not participate in the endless responsibilities of citizenship and are resigned to live lives determined by others. To lose your identity as a citizen of democracy is but a step from losing your identity as a person. People react to this frustration by not acting at all. The separation of the people from the routine daily functions of citizenship is heartbreak in a democracy. It is a grave situation when people resign their citizenship or when a resident of a great city, though they may desire to take a hand, lacks the means to participate. That citizen sinks further into apathy, further into anonymity, and further into depersonalization. The result is that they come to depend on public authority and a state of civic sclerosis sets in. From time to time, there have been eternal enemies at our gates. There has always been the enemy within, the hidden and malignant inertia that foreshadows more certain destruction to our life and future than any nuclear warhead. There can be no darker or more devastating tragedy than the death of man's faith in himself and his power to direct his own future. I salute the present generation. Hang on to one of your most precious parts of youth, laughter. Don't lose it, as many of you seem to have done. You need it. Together, we may find some of what we're looking for. Laughter, beauty, love, and the chance to create. Oh, there's, there's the prologue. That's, that's the prologue. That's his, that's his statement. That's his, that's his argument. It's get your shit together. And while Saul was most assuredly a sort of, um, he believed in a lot of tenets that the anarchist 
d- don't necessarily believe in. You can see how any anarchist can read this and go, wait, okay, individual autonomy leading to the strengthening of the social group, creating free associative groups that lead to mutual aid and community organization, right? Like he's talking our language. He's speaking our language. He's right, speaking right to us. It's just he's, he's a voter, right? He believes in democracy. He believes in that system. But he never turned away an anarchist. Never. He never turned away, he never turned anyone away who truly wanted to learn. He was very magnanimous in how he dispensed his knowledge. It was, these are the lessons I have to teach. Now, the prologue is most assuredly his, his declarative statement moving forward. It's very much Saul Alinsky stating, these are my beliefs, these are my tenets, these are, this is what I, this is what I believe. But like I said, this book has lessons to teach and you need to be open to them. Let's just put it that way. Um, Let's see. Is this? Yeah, that's the purpose. Um, Where does this chapter end? There we go. Of means and ends. Um, Do I have a page count here? I mean, we could go for it. Uh, we could go for it. Um, yeah, why not? <clears throat> why not? Keep in mind, he was also religious. Um, so he, he, he was a big fan of biblical takes. He saw it as a way to... I think he saw it as a way of manipulating the mass mass of the public. I think he, I, legitimately, I think having read Alinsky, um, he was brought up in a religious household. He was brought up religious, but I also think he saw it as like a lever that he could push on. Like, yeah, people believe this. People act this way. People engage in this this manner. So why shouldn't I utilize it just like I use everything? One of uh, one of the one of his most infamous rules. We'll get to the actual rules. By the way, there is a list of rules. By the way, um, one of the more infamous rules is making the system live up to its own rules. Um, and so this is this is the sort of um, methodology, like uh, an anarchist who doesn't believe in intellectual property rights, DMCA striking a capitalist who's acting in bad faith. Right? Like, we don't believe in the fucking DMCA bullshit. We don't believe in intellectual property rights. But holding somebody who believes in that system to their own standard and forcing them to abide by their own rules is most assuredly a lesson the likes of which anarchists should be taking from Saul Alinsky. Right? Just because we don't believe in it doesn't mean you get to be uh, non-consistent with your beliefs. Forcing somebody to be self-consistent, forcing a system to adhere to its own bullshit rules is a great way to undermine and grind a system or an individual to a halt like that. (laughs) Uh, a resolution. What was your degree in? I know you've mentioned it before. Um, it was community development. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Fuzzy slippers. Um, when, when referring to, I believe it was a prison reformation issue, right? It's, it's, um, literally prison administrative processes. If the rule is that every letter gets a reply, send 30,000 letters. Yeah. It was about, it was a methodology of organizing prison, internal prison labor. If you've got five guys that can construct letters and you've got 30 guys that can copy letters, 
then have the five guys writing unique letters, have the 30 guys copying those five letters five times. And then, you know, it's that sort of methodology. It was literally um, how to how to fuck with prison administration. That's literally Alinsky right there. How to fuck with prison administration. This is this is the kind of lessons this dude has to teach. You just have to be willing to listen. You're going to encounter some things that as anarchists, you're not going to necessarily agree with. Get over it. Get the fuck over it. He's a pragmatist. Saul Alinsky more than anything else. Remember, a pragmatic primer. He's a pragmatist. Fucking get over yourself. Take, take what you should take, leave what you want to leave, but there's some highly valuable lessons contained within these fucking pages and shit like fuzzy slipper right out of the gate. Like that's, yeah, it, it's, it bothers me that people haven't read Alinsky. It really does. So here we go. <clears throat> oh. Oh. This generation needs to learn pragmatism so badly, too. Yeah. Hardcore. Hardcore. I, I, I can't even begin to fucking... Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> I, I can't even begin to express it. It's so insane how, like, non-pragmatic this generation is. Like, in my generation, millennial, Gen Z, Gen Z especially... Right, like it was bad with the fucking millennials, but it's really bad with the Zoomers. Um. So, all right, here we go. <clears throat> we'll go on to the purpose. We'll see if we'll see if we can't get this chapter knocked out. Um. It's. What did I say? Twenty some pages, or something like that. That's the way that's means and ends. Um, all right. 23. That's uh, four, three. All right. So it's 20 pages. <clears throat> uh, yes. And that yet, um, uh, Gemma, um, and yet, so much of it rings to like, it, I don't know if you saw chat, like several people mentioned like they quotes, they're like, holy shit, this, like this one hits me right in the feels sort of shit. Like it's astounding how similar and I'm, I'm mildly terrified that the millennials and Gen Z's may end up pulling a boomer. It, it's the path is eerily similar. It, it, it's yeah students of history it's a little disturbing um some of us keep the faith I, Gemma I try and keep the faith I try and keep the faith dude Gen Xers though fucking y'all are throw a generation and you know it y'all just opted out um fucking uh public the book is the playlist will be available um the playlist will be available it'll go under theory yeah yeah. Oh, yeah. Gen Xers fucking completely opted out. Um, let's see. Hold on. Let me make sure. LMN public, 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 public. There you go. Rolls. Oh, yeah. You have a library card. Yeah, you're fine. Public. You can go. You can find either way. Um, let's see. Close that. Oh, fuck's sake. Better Discord fucking fucking, 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 close that. Hold on, give me one sec. Um, that one. There's Discord. Mm, I need to update my plugin now. God damn it. All right, fine. I'll do it later. I'll do it later. Um... All right. Oh. And I mean, y'all can feel free. Like if you guys want to, I know you guys are listening and I actually love it that you guys like literally stop typing. 
And like, I can I see that like, you know, 50, 50 fucking six people, something like that. Like literally just stop typing when I'm reading and I love it. Don't get me wrong, but you're feel free to like fucking chat and type. Like if you want to discuss shit we're talking about, I get it. It doesn't disturb me to see chat scrolling by over here. Um, but nonetheless, Oh, uh, thank you for the gift sub. I'm sorry. That went by because my, my, all of my alerts are turned off, but, uh, John T one, if that's how I say that, uh, but John, thank you. Thank you for the gift sub and congratulations, Gemma. Uh, yeah. And crystal, you'll see from time to time, I'll put emphasis or change the rhetoric. Like, um, I'll, I'll use like an isocolon scheme, like a, a tricolon scheme from time to time and um, change. So there will be, I will take some artistic flirt, uh, uh, license occasionally with like turns of phrase because like in my mind, I'll, I'll be like, you know what? I can, I can emphasize this better or differently. I can make this more impactful as, a, as an orative experience rather than a reading experience. Um, so yeah, you'll notice those differences from time to time that like it fucking, there was no freedom, freedom, freedom sort of situation, but I added, I create, you know, I used a, a tricolon scheme rather because it's more effective <clears throat> from a, at least a rhetorician's point of view. Um, so yeah, occasionally I'll, I'll, a little artistic license, um, Yeah, if you have a library card um, and you're on the Discord server, then you're good to go. You don't have to go looking. Um, Gemma, take care of yourself. Congratulations on the the uh, the art school thing. I hope it I hope it lives up to your expectations. Um, but thanks for hanging out. Thanks for stopping by, Gemma. Um. Yes, Crystal, where, what's your fucking, are you, um, Crystal Gears, all right, now, now look around, Crystal, and just don't talk about it, just, you're welcome, leave it at that, you have the role on Discord, all right, <clears throat> let's get this fucker going. Because I have 20 pages I have to get through. <clears throat> um, oh, that is killing me. This fucking Discord theme is absolutely murdering my eyes. I'm sorry. Like, I have to. I have to. I have to. Where's... These are all app settings. These are all... Oh, it's because fucking better Discord completely, like, shit the bed. All right. Give me, give me one fucking second here. Um... There we go. Uh, download, run it. And repair it. That one and repair. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely reinstall it. Close. All right. Now let's try it. Oh, so much better. <sighs> fucking fix the theming. Ugh, God, get rid of all their fucking Nitro ads. Better Discord. Better Discord. If you guys don't know, betterdiscord.app, you can mod the PC version of Discord. You know that, right? Like you can download plugins and mod the theme and shit like that. Better Discord.app. So much better. All right. Anyway. <clears throat> yeah, it, it legitimately is mandatory. Yeah, 100% Caleb. All right. The purpose. The life of man upon earth is a warfare. Job 7.1. 
What follows is for those who want to change the world from what it is to what they believe it should be. The Prince was written by Machiavelli for the haves on how to hold power. Rules for Radicals is written for the have-nots on how to take it away. In this book, we're concerned with how to create mass organizations to seize power and give it to people. To realize the democratic dream of equality, justice, peace, cooperation, equal and full opportunities for education, full and useful employment, see Bob Black on that one, health and the creation of those circumstances in which man can have the chance to live by values that give meaning to life. We're talking about a mass power organization which will change the world into a place where all men and women walk erect in the spirit of that credo of the Spanish Civil War, better to die on your feet than to live on your knees. This means revolution. The significant changes in history have been made by revolutions. There are people who say that it's not revolution, but evolution that brings about change. But evolution is simply the term used by non-participants to denote particular sequence of revolutions as they synthesized into a specific major social change. In this book, I propose certain general observations, propositions, and concepts of the mechanics of mass movements and the various stages of the cycles of action and reaction in revolution. This is not an ideological book, except insofar as argument for change, rather than for the status quo, can be called an ideology, different, uh, different people, Different, uh, in different places, in different situations, and different times, will construct their own solutions and symbols of salvation for those times. This book will not contain any panacea or dogma. I detest and fear dogma. I know that all revolutions must have ideologies to spur them on, that in the heat of conflict, these ideologies tend to be smelted into rigid dogmas, claiming exclusive possession of truth and that the keys to paradise is tragic. Dogma is the enemy of human freedom. Dogma must be watched for and apprehended at every turn and twist of the revolutionary movement. The human spirit glows from that small inner light of doubt whether we're right. While those who believe with complete certainty that they possess the right are dark inside and darken the world outside with cruelty, pain, and injustice. Those who enshrine the poor or have-nots are as guilty as other dogmatists and just as dangerous. To diminish the danger that ideology will deteriorate into dogma and to protect the free, open, questing, and creative mind of man— as well as to allow for change, no ideology should be more specific than that of America's founding fathers for the general welfare. Niels Bohr, the great atomic physicist, admirably stated that ci the civilized position on dogmatism, every sentence I utter must be understood not as an, affirmative, uh, uh, as an affirmation, but as a question. I will argue that man's hopes lie in the acceptance of the great law of change and that a general understanding of the principles of change will provide clues for rational action and an awareness of the realistic relationship between means and ends and how each determines the other. I hope that these pages will contribute to the education of the radicals of today and to the conversion of hot, emotional, impulsive passions that are impotent and frustrating to actions that will be calculated, purposeful, and effective. An example of the political insensitivity of many of today's so-called radicals and the lost opportunities is found in this account of an episode during the trial of the Chicago 7. Over the weekend, some 150 lawyers from all parts of the country had gathered in Chicago to picket the federal building in protest against Judge Hoffman's arrest of the four lawyers 
This delegation, which was supported by 13 members of the faculty of Harvard Law School and which included a number of other professors as well, submitted a brief as friend of the court which called Judge Hoffman's actions a travesty of, a travesty of justice which threatens to destroy the confidence of the American people in the entire judicial process. By 10 o'clock, the angry lawyers had begun to march around the federal building, where they were joined by hundreds of student radicals, several Black Panthers, and a hundred or more blue-helmeted Chicago police. Shortly before noon, about 40 of the picketing lawyers carried their signs into the lobby of the federal building, despite the notice posted on the glass wall beside the entrance and signed by Judge Campbell, forbidding such demonstrations within the building. Hardly had the lawyers entered, however, than Judge Campbell himself descended into the lobby, dressed in his black robes and accompanied by a marshal, a stenographer, and his court clerk. Surrounded by the angry lawyers who were themselves encircled by a ring of police and federal marshals, the judge proceeded to hold court then and there. He announced that unless the pickets withdrew immediately, he would charge them with contempt. This time, he warned, there could be no question that their contempt would occur in the presence of the court and would thus be subject to summary punishment. No sooner had he made this announcement, however, than a voice from the throng shouted, Fuck you, Campbell! After a moment of tense silence... Followed by a cheer from the crowd and a noticeable stiffening amongst the police, Judge Campbell himself withdrew. Then the lawyers, too, left the lobby and rejoined the pickets on the sidewalk. Written by Jason Epstein, The Great Conspiracy Trial, Random House, published 1970. The picketing lawyers threw away a beautiful opportunity to create a nationwide issue. Offhand, there would, have been to, there would seem to have been two choices, either of which would have forced the judge's hand and kept the issue going. Some, uh, some one of the lawyers could have stepped up to the judge after the voice said, fuck you, Campbell, and said that the lawyers there did not support personal obscenities, but they were not leaving, or all the lawyers together could have chorused with one voice and said, fuck you, Campbell. They did neither. Instead, they let the initiative pass from them to the judge and achieve nothing. Radicals must be resilient, adaptable to shifting political circumstances, and sensitive enough to the process of action and reaction to avoid being trapped by their own tactics and forced to travel a road not of their own choosing. In short, Radicals must have a degree of control over the flow of events. Here, I propose to present an arrangement of certain facts and general concepts of change, a step towards a science of revolution. All societies discourage and penalize ideas and writings that threaten the ruling status quo. It is understandable, therefore, that the literature of a have society is a veritable desert whenever we look for, uh, for writings on social change. Once the American Revolution was done with, we can find very little besides the right of revolution that is laid down in the Declaration of Independence as a fundamental right. 73 years later, Thoreau's brief es a brief essay on the duty of civil disobedience, followed by Lincoln's reaffirmation of the revolutionary right in 1861. <clears throat> there are many phrases extolling the sacredness of revolution, that is, revolutions of the past. Our enthusiasm for the sacred right of revolution is increased and enhanced with the passage of time. The older the revolution, the more it recedes into history and the more sacred it becomes. Except for Thoreau's limited remarks, our society has given us very few words of advice, few suggestions of how to fertilize social change. From the haves, on the other hand, there's come in an unceasing flood of literature justifying the status quo. Religious, economic, social, political, and legal tracts endlessly attack all revolutionary ideas and action for change as immoral, fallacious, and against God, country, and mother. 
These literary seditions by the status quo include the threat that, since all such movements are unpatriotic, subversive, spawned in hell, and reptilian in their creeping insidiousness, dire punishments will be meted out to those supporters. All great revolutions, including Christianity, the various reformations, democracy, capitalism, and socialism have su suffered these epithets in the times of their birth. To the status quo concerned about its public image, revolution is the only force which has no image, but instead casts a dark, ominous shadow of things to come. The have-nots of the world, swept up in their present upheavals and desperately seeking revolutionary writings, can find such literature only from the communists, both red and yellow, and sometimes the anarchists. Have here they can read about tactics, maneuvers, strategies, principles of action in the making of revolutions. Since in this literature, all ideas are embedded in the language of communism, revolution appears synonymous with communism. When in the throes of their revolutionary fervor, the have nots hungrily turn us to the in their fir first few steps from star uh, starvation to subsistence. We respond with a bewildering, unbelievable, and meaningless conglomeration of abstractions about freedom, mor morality, equality, and the danger of intellectual enslavement by communistic ideology. This is accompanied by charitable handouts dressed up in ribbons of moral principle and freedom, with the price tag of unqualified political loyalty to us. With the coming of the revolutions in Russia and China, we suddenly underwent a moral conversion and became concerned for the welfare of our brothers all over the world. Revolution by the have-nots has a way of inducing a moral revelation amongst the haves. Revolution by the have-nots also induced a paranoid fear. Now, therefore, we find every corrupt and repressive government the world around saying to us, Give us money and soldiers or there will be a revolution and the new leaders will be your enemies. Fearful of revolutions and identifying ourselves as the status quo, we've permitted the communists to assume by default the revolutionary halo of justice for the have-nots. When then compound, We then compound this mistake by assuming that the status quo everywhere must be defended and buttressed against revolution. Today, revolution has become synonymous with communism, while capitalism is synonymous with status quo. Occasionally, we'll accept a revolution if it's guaranteed to be on our side, and then only when we realize that the revolution is inevitable. We abhor revolutions. We've permitted a suicidal situation to unfold wherein revolution and communism have become one. These pages are committed to splitting this political atom, separating this exclusive identification of communism with revolution. If it were possible for the have-nots of the world to recognize and accept the idea that revolution, a revolution did not inevitably mean hate and war, cold or hot, from the United States, that alone would be a great revolution in world politics and the future of man. This is a major reason for my attempt to provide a revolutionary handbook, not cast in a communist or capitalist mold but as a manual for the have-nots of the world regardless of the color of their skin or their politics. My aim here is to suggest how to organize for power, how to get it, and how to use it. I will argue that the failure to use power for a more equitable distribution of the means of life for all people signals the end of the revolution and the start of the counter-revolution. Revolution has always advanced with an ideological spear just as the status quo has inscribed its ideology upon its shield. All of life is partisan. There is no dispassionate objectivity. The revolutionary ideology is not confined to a specific limited formula. It is a series of general principles rooted in Lincoln's May, 19, uh, May, 5, uh, Lincoln's May 19, 1856 statement, Be not deceived. Revolutions do not go backwards. The ideology of change. This raises the question, what, if any, is my ideology? What, what kind of ideology, if any, can an organizer who is working in and for a free society, 
The prerequisite for an ideology is possession of a basic truth. For example, a Marxist begins with his prime truth that all evils are caused by the exploitation of the proletariat by the capitalists. From this, he logically proceeds to the revolution to end capitalism. Then into the third stage of reorganization into a new social order or the dictatorship of the proletariat. The Christians also begin with their prime truth, the divinity of Christ and the triperate uh, tripe uh, 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 nature of God. Out of these prime truths flow a step-by-step -step ideology. An organizer working in and for an open society is an ideological dilemma. To begin with, he does not have a fixed truth. Truth to him is relative and changing. Everything to him is relative and changing. Politi he is a political relativist. Accepts the late justice learned hands to statement that the mark of a free man is that the ever gnawing inner uncertainty as to whether or not he is right. The consequence is that He's ever on the hunt for the cause of man's plights and the general propo uh, propositions that help to make some sense out of the man's irrational world. He must com constantly examine life, including his own, to get some ideas of what it's all about, and he must challenge and test his own findings. Irreverence, essential to questioning, is a requisite. Curiosity becomes compulsive. His most frequent word is why. Some say it's no coincidence that the question mark is an inverted plow breaking up the hard soil of old beliefs and preparing for the new growth. Does this then mean that the organizer in a free society for a free society is rudderless? No. I believe that they have a far better sense of direction and compass than the closed society organizer with their rigid political ideology. First, the free society organizer is loose resilient, fluid, and on the move in a society which itself is in a state of constant change. To the extent that they are free from the shackles of dogma, they can respond to the realities of the widely different situations our society presents. In the end, they have one conviction, a belief that if people have the power to act in the long run, they will, most of the time, reach the right decisions. The alternative to this would be ruled by the elite, either a dictatorship or some form of political aristocracy. I'm not concerned if this faith in people is regarded as a prime truth and therefore a contradiction of what I've already written, for life is a story of contradictions. Believing in people, the radical has the job of organizing them so that they will have the power and opportunity to best meet each unforeseeable future crisis as they move ahead in their eternal search for those values of equality, justice, freedom, peace, and a deep concern for the preciousness of human life and all those rights and values propounded by the Judeo-Christianity and the political, democratic political tradition. Democracy is not an end but a means towards achieving these values. This is my credo for which I live, and if need be, die. The basic requirement for the understanding of the politics of change is to recognize the world as it is. We must work with it on its own terms if we are to change it to the kind of world we would like it to be. We must first see the world as it is and not as we would like it to be. We must see the world as all political realists have in terms of, quote, what men do and not what they ought to do, as Machiavelli and others put it. It is painful to accept fully the simple fact that one begins from where one is. That one must break free of the web of illusions one spins about life. Most of us view the world not as it is, but as we would like it to be. The preferred world can be seen any evening on television, in the succession of programs where the good always wins, that is, until the late evening newscast, when suddenly we're plunged into the world as it is. With some exceptions, in one of America's Shangri-Las of Escape from the World as it is, Carmel by the Sea, uh, Carmel by the sea California, on the coast of the beautiful Monterey Peninsula, radio station KRML used to broadcast the Sunshine News, 
which headlines the positive, only the good news in the world. Intellectuals would scoff at sunshine news as there are no exceptions to the preference for already formulated answers. Political realists see the world as it is, an arena of power politics moved primarily by perceived immediate self-interest where morality is rhetorical rationale for expedient action and self-interest. Two examples would be the priest who wants to be a bishop and bootlicks and politics his way up, justifying it with the rationale, well, after I get to be a bishop, I'll use my office for Christian reformation. Or the businessman who reasons, first I'll make my million, and after that, I'll go for the real things in life. Unfortunately, one changes in many ways on the road to the bishoric, uh, the, the, yeah, bishoric, uh, or the first million. And then one says, well, I'll wait until I'm a cardinal, and then I can be more effective. Or I can do a lot more after I get two million, and so it goes. In this world, laws are written for the lofty aim of the common good, and then acted out in, uh, in life on the basis of the common greed. In this world, irrationality clings to man like his shadow so that the right things are done for the wrong reasons. Afterwards, we dredge up the right reasons for justification. It is a world not of angels, but of angles, where men speak of moral principles, but act on power principles, where men speak, uh, where we are always moral and our en enemies are always immoral. A world where reconciliation means that when one side gets the power and the other side gets reconciled to it, then we have reconciliation. A world of religious institutions that have, in the main, come to support and justify the status quo. So that today, organized religion is materially solvent and spiritually bankrupt. We live with a Judeo-Christian ethic that has not only accompanied, uh, accommodated itself to, but justified slavery, war, and every other human, uh, ugly human exploitation of which ever status quo happened to prevail. We live in a world where good is a value dependent on whether we want it. In the world as it is, the solution of each problem inevitably creates a new one. In the world as it is, there are no permanent happy or sad endings. Such endings belong to the world of fantasy, the world as we would like it to be, the world of children's fairy tales where they lived happily ever after. In the world as it is, the stream of events surges endlessly onward with death as the only terminus. One never reaches the horizon. It's always just beyond, ever beckoning onward. It is the pursuit of life itself. This is the world as it is. This is where you start. It is not a world of peace and beauty and dispassionate rationality, but as Henry James once wrote, quote, life is, in fact, a battle. Evil is insolent and strong. Beauty is enchanting but rare. Goodness very apt to be weak. Folly very apt to be defiant. Wickedness to carry the day. Imbeciles to be great in places. People of sense in small. And mankind generally unhappy. But the world as it stands is no narrow illusion, no phantasm, no evil dream of the night. We wake up to it again forever and ever and we can neither forget it nor deny it nor dispense with it. Henry James's statement is an affirmation of that of Job. The life of man upon earth is a warfare, Disraeli put it succinctly. Political life must be taken as you find it. Once we have moved into the world as it is, then we begin to shed fallacy after fallacy. The prime illusion we must rid ourselves is of the conventional view in which things are seen separate from their inevitable counterparts. We know intellectually that everything functionally interrelated. Uh, we know intellectually that everything is functionally interrelated, but in our operations, we segment and isolate all values and issues. Everything about us must be seen as the indivisible partner of its converse light and darkness, good and evil, life and death. From the moment we are born, we begin to die. Happiness and misery are inseparable. So are peace and war. 
The threat of destruction from nuclear energy conversely carries the opportunity of peace and plenty. And so with every component of this universe, all is paired in this enormous Noah's Ark of Life. Life seems to lack re rhyme or reason or even a shadow of order unless we approach it with the key of converses. Seeing everything in its duality, we begin to get some dim clue to direction and what it's all about. It's in these contradictions and their incessant interacting tensions that crea creativity begins. As we begin to accept the concept of contradiction, we see every problem or issue in its whole interrelated si uh, sense. We then recognize that for every positivity, there is a negativity and that there is nothing positive without its con uh, concomitant negative, nor any political paradise without its negative side. Niels Bohr pointed out that the appearance of the contradictions was a signal that the experiment was on the right track. There is, quote, there is not much hope if we have only one difficulty, but when we have two, we can match them off against each other. Bohr calls this complementarity, meaning that the interplay of seemingly conflicting forces or opposites is the actual harmony of nature. Whitehead similarly observed, quote, in formal logic, a contradiction is the signal of a defeat, but in the evolution of real knowledge, it marks the first step in progress towards a victory. Everywhere you look, all change shows this complementarity. In Chicago, the people of Upton Sinclair's jungle, then the worst slum in America, crushed by starvation wages when they worked, demoralized, diseased, living in rotted shacks, were organized. Their banners proclaimed equality for all races, job security, and a decent life for all. With their power, they fought and won. Today, as a part of the middle class, they're also a part of our racist discriminatory culture. The Tennessee Valley Authority was one of the prized jewels in the Democratic crown. Visitors came from every part of the world to see, admire, and study this physical and social achievement of a free society. Today, it's the scourge of the Cumberland Mountains, strip mining for coal and wreaking havoc on the countryside. The CIO was the militant champion of Americans' workers of America's workers, in its ranks, directly and indirectly, were all of America's radicals. They fought the corporate structure of the nation in one. Today, merged with the AF, uh, AFL, it's an entrenched member of the establishment and its leaders supported the war in Vietnam. Another example is today's high-rise public housing projects. Originally conceived and carried through as major advances in riddle, uh, ridding cities of slums, they involved the tearing down of rotting, rat-infested tenements and the erection of modern apartment buildings. They were acclaimed as America's refusal to permit its people to live in the dirty shambles of the slums. It's common knowledge that they've turned into jungles of horror and now confront us with the problem of how we can either convert or get rid of them. They have become compounds of double segregation on the basis of both economy and race and a danger for anyone compelled to live in these projects. A beautiful positive dream has grown into a negative nightmare. It is the universal tale of revolution and reaction. It is the constant struggle between the positive and its converse negative, which includes the reversal of roles so that the positive today is the negative of tomorrow and vice versa. This view of nature recognizes that reality is dual. The principles of quantum mechanics in physics apply even more dramatically to the mechanics of mass movements. This is true not only in complementarity, but in the rep uh, repudiation of the here to, uh, here to uh, universal concept of causality, whereby matters in physics were understood in terms of cause and effect, where for every effect there had to be a cause and one always produced the other. In quantum mechanics, causality was largely replaced by probability. An electron or atom did not have to do anything specific in response to a particular force. There was just a set of probabilities that it would react in this or that way. This is fundamental in the observations and propositions which follow. At no time in any discussion or analysis of mass movements, tactics, or any other phase of the problem can it be said that if this is done, then that will result. 
The most we can hope for is to achieve an understanding of the probabilities consequent to certain actions. This grasp of the duality of all phenomena is vital in understanding our, uh, is in vital in our understanding of politics. It frees one from the myth that one approach is positive and one approach is negative. There is no such thing in life. One man's positive is another man's negative. The description of any procedure as positive or negative is the mark of political uh, of a political illiterate. Once the nature of revolution is understood from the dualistic outlook, we lose our mono view of a revolution and see it coupled with the inevitable counter-revolution. Once we accept and learn to anticipate the inevitable counter-revolution, we may then alter the historical pattern of revolution and counter-revolution from the traditional slow advance of two steps forward and one step backward to minimizing the latter. Each element with its positive and converse side is fused to the other related elements in an endless series of everything, so that the converse of revolution on one side is counter-revolution, and on the other side, reformation, and so on in an endless chain of con uh, connected converses. Class distinctions, the trinity. The setting for the drama of change has never varied. Mankind has been and is divided into three parts. The haves, the have-nots, and the have-a-little want-mores. On top of the haves, with power, money, food, security, and luxury, they suffocate in their surpluses while the have-nots starve. Numerically, the haves have always been the fewest. The haves want to keep things as they are as, and are opposed to change. Thermopolitically, they're cold and determined to freeze the status quo. On the bottom are the world's have-nots. On the world scene, they are by far the greatest in numbers. They are chained together by the common misery of poverty, rotten housing, disease, ignorance, political impotence, and despair. When they're employed, their jobs pay the least, and they are deprived in all areas basic to human growth. Caged by color, physical or political, they're barred any oppor an opportunity to represent themselves in the politics of life. The haves want to keep. The have-nots want to get. Thermopolitically, they are a mass of cold ashes of resignation and fatalism, but inside they're glowing embers of hope, which can be fanned by the building of means of attaining power. Once the fever begins, the flame will follow. They have nowhere to go but up. They hate the establishment of the haves with its, arrogance op with its arrogant opulence, its police, its courts, and its churches. Justice, morality, law, and order are mere words when used by the haves, which justify and secure their status quo. It has been said that the haves, living under the nightmare of possible threats to their possessions, are always faced with the question of, when do we sleep? While the perennial question of the have-nots is, when do we eat? The cry of the have-nots has never been, give us your hearts, but always, get off our backs. They ask not for love, but for breathing space. Between the haves and have-nots are the have-a-little, want-mores, the middle class. Torn between upholding the status quo to protect what little they have, yet wanting change so that they can get more, they become split personalities. They could be described as social, economic, and political schizoids. Generally, they seek the safe way where they can profit by change and yet not risk losing the little they have. They insist on a minimum of three aces before playing a hand in the poker game of revolution. Thermopolitically, they are tepid and rooted in inertia. Today in Western society, and particularly in the United States, they comprise the majority of our population. Yet, in the conflicting interests and contradictions within the have a little want mores, is the genesis of creativity. Out of this class have come, with a few exceptions, the great world leaders of change of the past centuries. Moses, Paul of Tarsus, Martin Luther... Robespierre, 
Georges Danton, Samuel Adams, Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, Napoleon Bonaparte, Giuseppe Garibaldi, Nikolai Lenin, Mahatma Gandhi, Fidel Castro, Mao Zedong, and others. Just as the clash of interests within the Have a Little Want Mores has bred so many of the great leaders, it's also spawned a particular breed of stalemated by cross interests into inaction. These do nothings profess a commitment to social change for ideals of justice, equality, and opportunity, and then abstain from and discourage all effective active, uh, action for change. They are known by their brand, I agree with your ends, but not your means. They function as blankets, whenever possible smothering sparks of dissension that promise to flare up into the fire of action. These do-nothings appear publicly as good men, humanitarians concerned with justice and dignity. In practice, they're invidious. They are the ones Edmund Burke referred to when he said acidically, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Both the revolutionary leaders or the doers and the do-nothings will be examined in these pages. The history of prevailing status quos shows decay and decadence infecting the opulent materialism of the haves. The spiritual life of the haves is a ritualistic justification of their possessions. More than 100 years ago, Tocqueville commented, as did other students of America at that time, that self-indulgence accompanied by concern for nothing except personal materialistic welfare was the major menace to America's future. Whitehead noted in Adventures of, the, of Ideas that the enjoyment of power is fatal to the subtleties of life. Ruling classes degenerate by reason of their lazy indulgence in obvious gratifications. In such a state, men may be said to fall asleep, for it is in sleep that each turns away from the world about us to our private worlds. I must quote one more book pertinent to this subject. In Alice in Wonderland, Tiger Lily explains about the talking flowers to Alice. Tiger Lily points out that the flowers that talk grow out of the hard beds of ground and in most gardens, Tiger Lily says, they make the beds too soft so that the flowers are always asleep. It is <laughs> as though the, a great law of change had prepared the anesthetization of the victim prior to the social surgery to come. Change means movement. Movement means friction. Only in a frictionless vacuum of a non-existent abstract world can movement or change occur without the, uh, without the abrasive friction of conflict. In these pages, it is our open political purpose to cooperate with the great law of change, to want otherwise would be like King Canute's commanding the tides and waves to cease. A word about my personal philosophy. It is anchored in optimism. It must be, for optimism brings with it hope, a future with a purpose, and therefore a will to fight for a better world. Without this optimism, there's no reason to carry on. If we think of the struggle as a climb up a mountain, then we must visualize a mountain with no top. We see a top, but when we finally reach it, the overcast rises and we find ourselves merely on a bluff. The mountain continues on up. Now we see the real top ahead of us and strive for it, only to find we've reached another bluff. The top still above us. And so it goes on interminably. Knowing that the mountain has no top, that is, that is a perpetual quest from plateau to plateau, the question arises, why the struggle, the conflict, the heartbreak, the danger, the sacrifice, why the constant climb? Our answer is the same as that which a real mountain climber gives when he is asked why he does what he does. Because it's there. Because life is there ahead of you. And either one tests oneself in its challenges or hurdles in the valleys in a dreamless day-to-day -day existence. Uh, I'm sorry. Because life is there ahead of you. And either one tests oneself in its challenges or huddles in the valleys in a dreamless day-to-day -day existence whose only purpose is the preservation of an illusory security and safety. The latter is what the vast majority of people want. What the vast majority of what people choose to do fearing the adventure into the unknown. Paradoxically, they give up the dream of what may lie ahead on the heights of tomorrow for a perpetual nightmare. 
an endless succession of days fearing the loss of a tenuous security. Unlike the chore of the mythic Sisyphus, this challenge is not an endless pushing up of a boulder to the top of the hill only to have it roll back again, the chore to be repeated eternally. It is the pushing the boulder up an endless mountain, but unlike Sisyphus, we're always going further upward, and also unlike Sisyphus, each stage of the trail upwards is different, newly dramatic, and an adventure each time. At times, we do fall back and become discouraged, but it's not that we're making no progress, simply that this is the very nature of life, that it is a climb, and that the resolution of each issue in turn creates other issues, born of plights which are unimaginable today. The pursuit of happiness is never-ending. Happiness lies in that pursuit. Confronted with the materialistic decadence of the status quo, one should not be surprised to find that all revolutionary movements are primarily generated from spiritual values and considerations of justice, equality, peace, and brotherhood. History is a relay of revolutions. The torch of idealism is carried by the revolutionary group until this group becomes an establishment. And then quietly the torch is put down to wait until a new revolutionary group picks it up for the next leg of the run. Thus, the revolutionary cycle goes on. A major revolution is to be won in the immediate future is the dissipation of man's illusions that his own welfare can be separate from that of all others. As long as man is shackled to this myth, so long will the human spirit languish. Concern for our, pri uh, for our private material well-being with disregard for the well-being of others is immoral according to the precepts of our Judeo-Christian civilization. But worse, it is stupidity worthy of the lower animals. It is man's foot still dragging in the primeval slime of his beginnings in ignorance and mere animal cunning. But those who know the interdependence of man to be his major strength in the struggle out of the muck have not been wise in their exhortations and moral pronouncements that man is his brother's keeper. On that score, the record of the past centuries has been a disaster. For it was wrong to assume that man would pursue morality on a higher level than his day-to-day -day living demanded. It was a disservice to the future to separate morality from man's daily desires and elevate it to a plane of altruism and self-sacrifice. The fact is that it is not man's better nature, but his self-interest that demands that he be his brother's keeper. We now live in a world where no man can have a loaf of bread while his neighbor has none. If he does not share his bread, he dare not sleep, for his neighbor will kill him. To eat and sleep in safety, man must do the right thing, if for seemingly the wrong reasons, and be in practice his brother's keeper. I believe that man is about to learn that the most practical way of life is the moral life and that the moral life is the only road to survival. He's beginning to learn that he will either share part of his material wealth or lose it all. That he will respect and learn to live with other political ideologies if he wants civilization to go on. This is the kind of argument that man's actual experience equips him to understand and accept. This is the low road to morality. There is no other. Um, where's my yellow tabs? Yeah, I don't use yellow on this book. There we go. The next chapter is called Of Means and Ends, which you can imagine what uh, somebody like Saul Alinsky has to say. Uh, <laughs> the, that perennial question, does the end justify the means, is meaningless as it stands. The real and only question regarding the ethics of means and ends is and always has been, does this particular end justify this particular means? He basically goes on to explain that the have-nots don't have a choice. The, the, the choice of means is a, um, is a privileged choice. 
and that when your back is against the wall, you're starving and the system has like put you into that position, you don't have a choice of means. Um, and so it's a, yeah, the, the of ends and means, uh, chapter is kind of, kind of ruthless. It's kind of fucking ruthless. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I do want to know though. Fucking. Yeah, this is the Gandhi one. Yeah, this is the Gandhi. Fucking, these words more than suggest that if Gandhi had had the weapons for violent resistance and the people to use them, then this means would not have been so unreservedly rejected as the world would like it to think. Um, in the Declaration of Independence uh, Mahatma, of Mahatma Gandhi issued January 26, 1930, he discussed the fourfold disaster to the country. Spiritual, uh, spiritually compulsory, compulsory disarmament, which has made us unmanly, and the presence of an alien army of occupation employed with deadly effect to crush us in the spirit of resistance had made us think we cannot look after ourselves or put up a defense against foreign aggression or even defend our homes and family. Right? Like Gandhi was like straight up like we've been disarmed and we've been morally crushed and there's an occupying army. Right? We don't have the means to do it. But it sort of implies that Gandhi is saying, if I had a fucking grenade, I'd throw it right now, bitch. Right? Like, that's that's the implication behind that statement is that, like, this is the only means that I have at my disposal for dealing with this issue and causing a revolution. But if I had 10,000 men with machine guns, y'all motherfuckers would be chased out at with machine gun fire. Gandhi wasn't a pacifist because he was a pacifist. He was a pacifist because the British military, the British Empire, disarmed India and fucking landed an occupying army in the, on their shores. Straight up. Easier reading than Bella Mare. I never had to Google more words in my fucking life. Look, I warn everybody. Bella Mare isn't for, intended for you to read. Bella Mare is intended for me to read. Bella Mare is not intended for most people to read. Um, yeah, like Bella Mare is f intentionally rough. He's making you work for it. Um, you have to prove yourself to read Bella Mare. He, he intentionally gatekeeps. Um, and if you read his, uh, his treatise, <laughs> Bella Mare is for boss level anarchists. It really is. Um, if you read his uh, techno-fascist treatise, which is like this thick, um, you understand why he, he gatekeeps. You're like, holy shit, there's some fucking ideas in here. He's intentionally keeping the masses away from. Um, I mean, you okay, yeah. Fucking Michelle. Michelle. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to give you dashes as well. Because he hyphenates everything. Oh, by the way, this is what it looks like. This isn't some off print. This is what Bill Amer chose to publish it looking like. It's physically difficult to read in addition to intellectually difficult to read. Okay? He, he quite literally makes this as opaque as possible for people. He, he's trying to keep people out. I'm going to read the hyphens. This is going to get ridiculous. Okay? This is on you, Red. This is on you. You wanted to hear some Bellamare? Hear some Bellamare. Conceptual, I'm, I'm just going to say dash for the hyphens because dash gets me quicker. Dash gets it there quicker, all right? Conceptual dash commodity dash value dash management requires continuous validation, objectification, and legitimization in order to solidify its arbitrary price, wage, and value determinations. Consequently, there are constant appeals to economists and autonomous free dash market da mechanisms such as supply and demand in order to validate, authenticate, and legitimate erroneous value, wage, and price machinations. Moreover, conceptual dash commodity dash value dash management as well mandates relationships between people, it um, 
It rank and files them arbitrarily according to the logical necessity of the logic of capitalism. For instance, via the conceptual dash commodity dash value dash management, so co via the conceptual commodity value management of a select few uh, micro fascist networks, movie stars and professional sports stars are arbitrarily ranked and filed at higher values, wages, prices, and statuses in relation to medical doctors and laborers within the military dash industrial dash complex. They are manufactured and celebrated by the ruling micro fascist oligarchical network of capital so as to radiate success onto specific industries and onto the bourgeois-state-capitalism in general. They are manufactured and applauded by the celebratory monologue that is bourgeois-state-capitalism as shining beacons of talent, perfection, and genius as outputs of greatness which could only have emanated from the political-economic framework of bourgeois-state-capitalism, despite being less educated, less useful, less knowledgeable. These star-like constructs are systemic emblems of higher rank and file, who owe their whole manufactured existence to the ideational, comprehensive framework of capitalism. These manufactured personalities who themselves stimulate obedient personality cults, shape mental and physical activities, processes, and behaviors of the work slash, the workforce slash population, which are taught to mimic these mythical creatures in their everyday relations, communications, and interactions. These artificial star-like constructs, or social betters, are not the product of autonomous mechanisms. They are the product of conceptual-commodity-value-management. They are artificially designed to engender suspicion of disbelief across the military-industrial complex so as to rivet segments of the workforce population ever more into the logical mechanics of the bourgeois state capitalism ad infinitum. That's one of the easier paragraphs. That's, that's simple. That's, I'm not kidding you. That's, 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 that's baseline. For fucking Bella Mayer. Like, legitimately, that's baseline. Um, The logic of capitalism unfettered and unbound strives for an ironclad authoritarian bourgeois state capitalism, i.e. military industrial complex, that is a form of socioeconomic organization where control, surveillance, and work in the service of the surplus value extraction, centralization, and accumulation is paramount, highly functionalist, highly technocratic, and highly regimented. The capitalistic military industrial complex is not a welfare state. It is a welfare, uh, it is a warfare state both internally against its industry and externally against its perceived enemies. As a result, the military industrial complex is a per perpetual state of crisis. Crisis. That is, crises of its own design to augment capitalist profits and unintended crises of retribution due to its tyranny and ever-increasing domination, uh, both at home and abroad. Disequilibrium is the primary socioeconomic condition of the all-encompassing military-industrial complex, as it is already in flux, state of constant antagonism, both internally and uh, externally. It is a technocratic administrative society where military, a militaristic organization and industrial production are synonymous stationed at the core of the socioeconomic processes, apparatuses, and mechanisms in and across bourgeois state capitalism in an effort to maximize profit and harness greater portions of the insatiable drive for ownership knowledge of the workforce population. And the logic of capitalism has engendered the industrialization of civilization and the militarization of the civilization in and across all levels of the military industrial complex, leading to the logic of capitalism doing this so as to maximize the interchangeability, standardization, utility, and division, systemization, and time management of the workforce population, which results in greater levels of accumulation, extraction, and centralization of surplus value. That is Bellamare. That's Bellamare. When when I talk about how Bellamare is like imperceivable in what he's talking about sometimes, that's Bellamare. That's that's the the structural anarchism manifesto, but here's where here's where I can I can go to bat for him, right? Because this this isn't designed for you. Like it's not it's not designed for you. It's designed for fucking theory nerds and academic types like me, right? I can read this. There's I've only had to DM him over a couple of terms in my life, um about like professor what the fuck are you talking about like there's no context to the usage of this term um for the most part i can understand this shit um but this book led to this channel existing 
I'm I'm not kidding you. This 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 is this thesis. This is this is the reason proudly radical exists. Um this book changed how I view my praxis. It, it's and see here's here's the thing. I showed you like some of Okay. This, this 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 did things for me. And once it clicked, I was like, oh, this is everything. This is this is this is everything I've been looking for. This is somebody who who coalesced the ideas and brought it into a realm that it made sense in my head for some reason. Of all the things to make sense in your head, this nightmare of a thesis, right? But, yeah, I'm super grateful for Bellamare, even though he's a dirty communist. He's an ANCOM. He's an ANCOM. But I will forever call him a dirty communist. <laughs> um, but he gets it. He really, really gets it on a level that's terrifying. Um, yeah, I, I really, really love this dude. But I really warn people, this shit is not meant to be read by... Ah, no, you're fine, Corey. Um, it's not read, it meant to be read by like a normal human. <laughs> it's just not. It's It's intentionally written this way it's absurd you know it's it's difficult to see here you see all these these what this says this is contra Marx these are all contradictions of Marx these are these are like literally economic analyses of Marxian theory and how he contradicts it directly and he literally marks it Contra Marx. Like, he's got an entire section. I am sitting up properly, dude. Like, I, I can't. Dude, any, like, I can't. I Like, I literally, like, my lumbar is right on the lumbar section of this chair. Like, I can't fucking sit up any more than this. Like, I don't know what you want from me, but I can't do any more than this. Um. Yeah. God, I love this book. Fucking crazy ass thesis. Uh, it is it in this regard that the logic of capitalism now functions and operates in the micro recesses of everyday life, where the fronts of struggle are no longer on a mass scale as in the past. The mass, uh, the many mass struggles of bygone eras, have been fragmented into microscopic skirmishes across the stratums of the bourgeois state capitalism. With these micro skirmishes present themselves in all sorts of systemic grievances, such as the war of words that break out in the Twitter sphere or Occupy movements, etc. All in all, these micro skirmishes present themselves in the daily decisions and actions human make, uh, humans make every day in their uh, daily lives across the stratums of the military industrial complex. These micro skirmishes also present themselves in the daily attempts by humans to realize the underlying logic of capitalism and failing. Uh, yeah. I love you, Bellamare. I do. You're crazy as fuck, but I love you. Um, so there you go. <laughs> I love that. Like for rules for radicals. Yeah. Fucking. Yeah. That was funny. Um, all right. Let me just check. Make sure those recordings went down fine. Um, two sixteen, two sixteen, two sixteen. That's probably the beginning, right? Yep. Rules for radicals. Yep. Okay, cool. The first two chapters of Rules for Radicals is in the can. I'll upload them. We can go from there. Um, I'm really hungry, and it's 10 o'clock. So I've been going for, what, four and a half hours? Yeah. Um, I've been more of this when? Well, more of this, not anytime soon. Um, more of this, probably tomorrow. Um, I'll, I'll try and get a few chapters done and get, get, I'll at least try and get 
the rules for radicals section done. That's, um, I'm pretty sure that's of means and ends. I'm pretty sure of means and ends is the rules for, uh, is like the actual rules section. Let me, let me just check. It's been a, it's been a minute, but I'm pretty sure. The 11th rule. Fifth rule. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, next check, next chapter. Oh, fucking A with it. Calm down. Um, oh shit. Let me turn everything back on though. Um, save settings. I have to fucking turn bits and raids and shit like that all back on. Um, hosts enabled. Um, subs and follows. There we go. Uh, um, I'm going to release you guys into the wild. I'm not going to raid you out. I, 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 I enjoy doing this from time to time, like literally just ending a stream and seeing what people do, um, rather than me shuffling you off somewhere. Um, so make up your own lives, make your own decisions. Uh, if you choose to continue watching Twitch, continue watching Twitch. If you don't, don't. Um, so yeah, I think that's the way I'm going to go tonight. I'm just going to, I'm just going to end the stream. Um, public, weird, uh, public, public. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sometimes, sometimes you just have to, you got to shake up the norm. Um, this is, you're still here at public. Um, yeah. If you want that section, that first section of rules for radicals, it'll be on the, it'll be on the YouTube page later tonight. Uh, I'll get them uploaded. Oh, any closing thoughts? No, no closing thoughts. Um, you know, if you're ever in school in Texas, don't go into a baseball, uh, like a boys baseball team locker room. That's all I'm saying. Uh, well, I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to raid into public loser. See if they're streaming. How's that? You you on the air? Probably. I'll 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 write right into you right now. Um <laughs> That's that's the option. The option is either I let I just release you guys into the wild or I raid into public loser. So <laughs> oh well then I guess I'm just gonna release you guys in the wild and I'm just gonna raid in a public loser, but I mean you know. Um Ah, uh, thank you, Corey. All right. Um yeah, I'm gonna go I've got food made actually. I've got some chicken already like grilled and shit like that. I'm gonna fucking chop it up, put it on a salad and have a nice chicken and on top of a salad sort of situation and do I have any sweet potatoes made? I don't think I have any sweet potatoes made. Oh, God damn it. I got to sort carbs. Either way, I'm going to go make some food. I might be on voice chat, though I've been running my voice. Doing readings is rough on the voice. Um, so I may just chill the fuck out for the rest of the night. But you may see me on voice chat on the Discord server. I will make an announcement. Not, uh, I won't tag everyone, but I will say what's up in the commons. I may get some Zomboid in. I may get some multiplayer Zomboid in. So, uh... Uh, you know what, public, give me a name. Public, give me a name. You got somebody who's sub 10 right now? Public, give me a name. Fine, fine. Public has, public has bullied me into raiding into a small channel. Um, public, what you got? Give me a name. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, put a, I'll put an announcement in the comments that I'm, I'm going to be in voice chat. I'm going to be doing multiplayer Zomboid. So if you're down a little later, probably in an hour, maybe a little more. Uh, I might get some Zomboid in. No guarantees, no promises though. So we'll see. We'll see what public produces here. Oh, apparently I unlocked an animated fucking um, one. Uh, you're not blocked. I checked, dude. You're on Discord. You're not blocked. Uh, okay. I'm I'm literally just going with your first one public. Give me a sec. Done. Oh god, World of Warships. Hold on. I may go with the other one. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm judging their game choice. <laughs> iRacing. Oh, shit. That's, that's a whole fucking thing. You know what? We're going to iRacing. Dude, iRacing is hardcore. Um... Oh, okay. I know boy. I know boy means many. Fuck is wrong with you. Fuck is wrong with y'all. Fucking 37 rating over. So this is one of my favorite things to do is chastise the non raiders. Either way, uh, I'm going to just push the button. So I'm going to take us over quicker. Um, but <laughs> fair to judge games. Uh, I do it too. Yeah. Fucking dude. Portal to war tanks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> either way, I'll catch y'all later. Love you. I'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow's Thursday, so tomorrow's a late night stream. So, all that that entails. Um, bye.